Thank you. I need a motion to, to go out of closed session. Senate. Second. Second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Perkins? Aye. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Mr. Cree? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Six ayes. Certification of closed meeting, whereas the Board of Supervisors of Montgomery County has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to the affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, whereas section 2.2-3711 of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the Board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors of Montgomery County, Virginia, hereby certifies that, to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempt from open meeting, certif open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification resolution applies and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion conveying the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the board. Do we have a motion to certification? So moved. Second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Fitz? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Mr. Cree? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Six ayes. Um, next uh, thing on the agenda <coughs> is our invocation. Uh, and we ask that uh, you keep Alcher uh, in your thoughts. Uh, he has uh, an illness in his family, and that's the reason why he's not here tonight. When we observe this moment of sil a silence, you can reflect any way you want to. Uh, and after the moment of silence, we'll be led in a pledge of allegiance by the county administrator. Let us pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. We have a delegation that's next on the agenda. Uh, it's uh, New River, Mount Rogers Workforce Development Board, and uh, we have a pleased to have Mr. Ronnie Martin here to give us a presentation tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the Board of Supervisors allowing me to be here tonight to uh, talk to you just a little bit about the, uh, the New River, Mount Rogers the Workforce Investment Area Consortium Board, uh, who we are and what we do. Um, our uh, board and our system really has developed uh, from the Workforce Investment Act that was signed into law in 1998. And uh, the Workforce Investment System itself is structured to flow from the Department of Labor through the governor to the State Workforce Council. The Virginia Community College System is the administrative entity for all of the Workforce Investment Act programs for the state. And then funds flow to lo local workforce investment areas. Those are groupings of jurisdictions that form themselves into areas in order to be able to receive those federal employment training dollars. And then we flow to local one-stop centers and program operators. Those are the ones that actually deliver the services for not only the citizens, but also for the employers in our area. Montgomery County is a part of local workforce investment area number two. This area ranges from Montgomery County all the way to the Tennessee line. Uh, it probably is uh, just about the widest distance-wise. The only other one might be up in the Shenandoah Valley. 
uh, from side to side, which is probably close to 130 miles. There are 10 counties and uh, three cities in this area. The workforce delivery structure in this area focuses on three key bodies. Uh, as you'll notice on the slide, on the left is the New River Mount Rogers Workforce Investment Area Consortium Board. That is our elected official representation. In the center is the New River Mount Rogers Workforce Investment Board. That is our private business sector and, and uh, one-stop partner representation. And on the right hand is the New River Mount Rogers Workforce Investment Area Youth Council. And the Youth Council focuses exclusively on youth issues uh, and youth policies. All three of these bodies were established under the Workforce Investment Act. That act, as I mentioned, was signed into law in 1998. In Virginia, it actually was implemented July 1 of 2000. Prior to that, we've had multiple employment and training types of programs, but this was the first one that was designed to directly connect the elected officials, the private sector, and youth representation in a one-stop service delivery concept where individuals can actually go to one-stop centers and receive a wide array of services, as well as go to satellite facilities and receive services also. Uh, all of the staffing actually work for the consortium board. Uh, we work for the elected official body, but if you'll notice the lines, uh, we also work for the Workforce Investment Board and for the Youth Council. Uh, so it's almost like we wear three hats. Uh, all staffing directly report up to the line for the consortium board, our operators and our one-stop centers actually report to the web and the youth operators to the youth council. The consortium board actually was formed uh, under the joint exercise of power provision on October 1, 2009. Prior to that, we had what was called uh, chief local elected officials board. Uh, the difference between the two, you might wonder, well, why did they come up with this one? Uh, they wanted to make sure that we had a bona fide legal entity in our area to receive and disperse funds. The Workforce Investment Board was just a board, as was the elected officials. So October 1, 2009, this, the New River Mount Rogers Workforce Investment Area Consortium Board was actually formed. Uh, there was uh, uh, action taken by all 13 jurisdictions. On this board, we have a 13-member board. Every jurisdiction has one seat on this board. Uh, the seat must be occupied by an elected official or the chief administrative officer, your county administrator, city, a city manager. No one else can sit on the board nor be an alternate to this board. And your representative is, uh, is Mr. Brown, who also serves as vice chair of our consortium board. Now, the elected official body uh, has several functions. They're responsible for actually appointing the members of the Workforce Investment Board. That's the one where you have your business representation and your one-stop partners. They also designate the grant recipient. Uh, the law requires a single jurisdiction be designated as the grant recipient to actually uh, receive the funds. Uh, Pulaski County, as the grant recipient, uh, merely functions as a pass-through. Pulaski County doesn't really do anything. Uh, Joe Sheffy signs the documents, but the funds flows through through the fiscal agent, and they go through the consortium board who actually verifies expenditures. Uh, if there's ever any disallowed cost, all 13 by agreement would share in those. Uh, we wanted the consortium board itself to be the grant recipient, but the state wouldn't, wouldn't allow it. They said it had to be a single one. Uh, the fiscal agent, uh, each area is allowed to designate a fiscal agent. In this area, the New River uh, Valley Planning District Commission is the fiscal agent. They handle all the funds. Uh, the staffing is actually a, a department within the Planning Commission. Uh, the consortium board has a contract with them uh, where, whereby they provide all the financial services. They ensure that it's audited every year. Uh, to make sure that everything is accounted for. The elected officials assume liability for funds, which is actually in the law, and they hire the staff. As I mentioned, we work directly for them. Uh, the, the Workforce Investment Board, uh, they're actually appointed by the consortium board. 
the elected officials appoint every member that's actually on the Workforce Investment Board. This is a, uh, a 31 member board that actually uh, has representation from uh, private business, at least 51% must be from the business sector by law. Uh, we also have representation from education, organized labor, community-based organizations, economic development organization, one-stop partners, and by those we're looking at um, adult education, Department of Rehab Services, all the programs in Virginia Employment Commission, Department of Blind and Vision Impaired, uh, Job Corps, HUD, various programs like that. Department of Social Services, those are the, the actual one-stop partners. One thing about uh, the, uh, the consortium board, when they were formed in 2009, they realigned the Workforce Investment Board. Prior to that, we had a 43-member board. Uh, they wanted to reduce the size and increase the percent of private business. Our membership now is 31, 18, biz 18 business, 13 non. Uh, but one uh, factor is that every jurisdiction uh, must have at least one business person, but, you, but no more than two. And currently, Montgomery County has one business representative, which is Michael Miller, Virginia Tech and Electric Properties. Uh, but you do have a, another position if you were to choose to appoint someone else. Each jurisdiction can have up to two. So we actually could have a total of 26 business and 13 non-business. The 13 number won't change, but the business number could. So I wanted to let the, the board know tonight that if you have anyone that might be interested in serving on the Workforce Investment Board, um, just let me know and I can get the necessary paperwork to you and have that person nominated. The boards actually nominate the full elected official body is the one it actually appoints. So you could take advantage of another business seat on the board. The Workforce Investment Board has certain functions, just like the elected official group. They're responsible for identifying and selecting our adult and dislocated worker service providers. One thing about the Workforce Investment Act, it is an employment and training piece of legislation. The focus is to help train individuals, uh, equip them with the skills they need so that they can get a decent job that has some growth potential, advancement potential, and hopefully be able to make a not only a living wage, but a wage that would lead to self-sufficiency for their family. We also focus a lot on credentials uh, so that people, maybe if they go to one job and decide to change, they've got some credentials that they can take, certifications, things of that nature, to the next employer. Uh, the board also selects uh, our youth providers. Uh, we identify training providers. The law requires that we can only send a person to a training provider that's actually been approved by the board. We have a training provider committee and, and their purpose is to review all applications to make sure the prior providers are legitimate, uh, that the costs are reasonable, that the training is for occupations that would be in demand in our area. Uh, and then once a list is established, any of our customers can be sent to providers on that list. Uh, they also encourage and promote participation of the private sector employers and direct disbursement of WIA funds. Uh, the elected officials actually review disbursements also, but they've allowed the Workforce Investment Board to basically run the programs. And our elected officials are dealing more with the large big picture oversight initiatives uh, looking more down the line, being more proactive and, and forward thinking. Uh, jointly, these two bodies are uh, charged with the responsibility of developing our, our regional plan, and that plan usually occurs every five years. They have to concur on our one-stop operator. That's the entity that is responsible for making sure that our centers have partner participation or delivering the services that the law requires. Uh, they develop and approve the, the board's budget. Uh, they negotiate performance measures with the state. They appoint the youth council members. Uh, and they oversee all the programs and, and initiatives under the Workforce Investment Act. And as I mentioned, that is our, that is our primary funding source is the Workforce Investment Act. We have some other initiatives that I'll cover in a few minutes, but that is the core of, of what we deal with. Uh, our Youth Council, this is the first piece of legislation since the mid-60s that actually has established a, a Youth Council. 
the youth council has the sole responsibility for uh, developing the youth portion of the plan. Uh, they develop any procurement documents for youth services. They develop strategies to meet the needs of our youth throughout the area. They report to the Workforce Investment Board and are appointed by the board. But basically, they, they function as their own entity, uh, specializing in youth. Now, in this area, uh, we have representation. We have 13 members from a wide variety of youth agencies. We've got youth service agencies, juvenile, uh, juvenile justice, K through 12. We've got some WIB members, public housing, parent of eligible youth, former participants, uh, and others that may be designated by the WIB. Now, normally, some jurisdictions will have an elected official representative and they'll have a workforce investment board, but a lot don't also have a youth council because they're not based on one per jurisdiction. It all depends on where they come from. Like Job Corps is in Marion. Our, our housing person is in Bristol. So it depends on where those come from. But you do have a representative on all three of the key bodies. Mary Kreitzer, uh, Montgomery Human Resource Director, uh, is our one of our representatives on the Youth Council uh, and does, a, does an excellent job, has great participation in our meetings. And as I mentioned briefly, some of the things that they do, they, they have to recommend to the Workforce Investment Board who to give funding to to deliver youth services. Um, we as boards under law aren't allowed to operate programs. Uh, we, the three entities, are oversight entities. And so we have to contract out for, or, to organizations to actually deliver the services. Uh, Goodwill Industries of the Valleys delivers our services in the New River Valley. People Incorporated of Virginia out of Abingdon delivers the services in the Mount Rogers area. Uh, and, but the Youth Council has to recommend each year who to fund for youth. Our other programs, our adult and our dislocated worker programs, uh, flow straight through the Workforce Investment Board. Uh, but youth is through this other entity. Uh, and they also do their own oversight of the youth activities. Uh, and then they, their focus is really to coordinate all these youth activities in the area. A lot of times they have like special focuses. One year they uh, put increased efforts on serving foster children. One year they were focusing on a lot of after school programs for a lot of our disadvantaged youth. Uh, and our youth have to be disadvantaged with a barrier. So there's a lot of needs that they have. And this group is very active. Uh, our current chairman with that group is Dr. Mark Burnett with the Carroll County School System uh, and, uh, and does an excellent job. Our focus with the Workforce Investment Act programs is really providing services and providing training. Uh, as I mentioned, we contract all this out, but the the big majority of all of our dollars goes to support training people and uh, assisting businesses. When it comes to individuals, there's three key groups of, of uh, customers we serve. Our dislocated worker is someone who lost their job due to a plant closure, a mass layoff. There's no income criteria there. These individuals are in need of retraining uh, or skills upgrading in order to be able to get a job. Our adult population, we can serve any adult, but priority service must be to the, the low income and public assistance recipients. And our youth have to be low income with a barrier. We also do programs that will serve employee workers, uh, the working poor that's working and their income is less than 150% of the poverty guidelines. We can, we can help train them for advancement in their company. We can do incumbent worker training where uh, maybe an employer has people that, uh, that aren't income eligible, but they need skills upgrading to actually keep their job. Uh, we, can, we can pay for half of that training if the employer pays the other half. In fact, I'm working with uh, Floyd County right now on a potential incumbent worker for a small, um, I believe it's a biochemical type company where there, a few of their people need certain types of classes in order to be able to continue working because of the way things are changing. Uh, and we're going to try to work out something where we can help assist with, with like half of that cost. Uh, and you can see down the list, we provide a wide variety of services. Uh, everything is customized. Uh, when a person comes in, any of our centers or at any of our sites, the services they receive are based on what that person needs. Someone may come in and only need job search assistance to get a job. All of those basic core services are provided to anybody and everybody free of charge. 
Uh, if you get to the next level of intensive services, we do an, an in-depth objective assessment. We help develop resumes, do work readiness training, career counseling, and we help the person through the assessment to determine what are they suited for? What are their aptitudes, interests, abilities? What's available in the area that they want to work in? Uh, then if they need training, we can pay the cost of training, supportive services, books, supplies, and things of that nature. Our goal is to really help them to get a good paying job uh, to where they won't need our services again. In a typical year, we probably will serve 11 to 1,200 clients uh, and all those clients spend somewhere around two and a half million dollars in a typical year. Uh, this past year that ended June 30, my allocation was a little over 2.6 million. The current year that started July 1, it's a little under 2.5. But with carryover funds, we usually have available around 3 million, give or take. And we usually can serve 11, 1,200 people easily. Um, we always try to have carryover funds because our adult dislocated worker money doesn't come all up front. Uh, we get a small piece of it July 1 and don't get the balance till October, November. So we have to maintain carryover so we don't have to stop our performance. Uh, we don't want to close our doors and not serve people. Our youth funds, we get all of it up front so it continues to run. Our employer services, we, we don't just serve the, the person on the street, the person looking for a job, we also serve the employer community. All of our one-stop centers are also Virginia Employment Commission offices, with the closest one for here being Radford. Uh, and, and through our centers, we help recruit applicants and refer applicants. Uh, and that's if an employer just wants to place a job order and get referrals. If the employer wants to, to work directly with our programs, we can do work experiences, we can place someone at the employer's site and pay the entire cost for the person, somebody that really needs to learn what work is all about. We can do internships where we pay a stipend for those people, usually like 30, 45 days where they get hands-on training with the intent the employer will you know, hopefully keep them. We do on-the-job training where we can reimburse up to half the wage if the employer is willing to train the person. Customized training, we can work with any employer, customizing whatever training they need if they're willing to cover half the cost. And occupational skills training, where we actually train the people and then they apply at the employer's site and the employer hires them. Uh, some employers don't want to go through the other processes because they don't like to deal with federal initiatives. Uh, they feel like it's intrusive, too much paperwork, uh, but if we know they've got a need for certain types of occupations and people have those interests, we can train our clients uh, for whatever skills they need and then send them over to actually apply for a job. Uh, and a lot of employers do that. Uh, I mentioned previously that, that we have certain contact points in our area uh, where people can actually go and access these services. Those that serve the Montgomery County area, our one-stop center is the Radford Virginia Employment Commission office. Uh, our dislocated worker case manager is Deborah Lambert. The adult and youth is Jenny Dehart. We have an office at the Christiansburg Mall, an adult and youth case manager, Sharon Reed. And the Radford Jobs Campus, which is over in Radford, that was the, uh, uh, at the workshop facility. Uh, Missy Bray is, uh, is over that office and they also have uh, case workers there. Uh, and there's various other sites where people can come and access services. In addition to the Workforce Investment Act, as I mentioned, that, that is our, our primary focus. But one thing about our, uh, our consortium board uh, that's different than in the past uh, there's a group on there now that are just uh, extremely forward-thinking. Uh, initially, this group started out really micromanaging, and, and, and Bill can, can uh, agree with that. But then they realized that they needed to focus on workforce issues in our entire area. And they instructed staff to really start pursuing other grants. The Workforce Investment Act ties your hands because there's only certain things you can do. Uh, when we deal with clients, they have to meet certain criteria or we can't do it. So they wanted to venture into areas where they could go after money that didn't have those strings. Uh, one grant that we participated in, which is about to end, was the CREATES grant, which basically is a green grant program. Uh, it deals with energy efficiency. 
The grant recipient for this grant is Community Housing Partners here in Christiansburg. Uh, and uh, I do want you to note that this, this program, the, this grant that we were involved in, was the 2012 Innovator Award from Southern Growth Policies Board. In fact, the board's deputy director, Marty Holliday, was at that meeting and accepted it on behalf of the group. That program was very successful, served over 500 people. Uh, I'm not sure what the final placement rate, we're still working with a lot of those clients. The advantage there is we could deal with people that were employed or not employed. If they were WA, we could deal with them. If they weren't, we could. We had lots of flexibility. The key was that they had to go into these kinds of occupations. We've also been involved recently in a, a, a special on-the-job training grant that was for prolonged unemployed displaced workers. Only five workforce areas in the state participated. Uh, that grant's going to end at the end of September. We serve, when we're finished, we'll serve about 40 clients. The advantage to this program is our reimbursement rate could go as high as 90% to employers. So a lot of the employers were very willing to take the long-term unemployed on and work with them. We've also been involved in a HIPE grant, Health Information Technology Education. That ends next June. Uh, we've worked closely with New River Community College, Virginia Highlands Community College, and Southwest Community College, plus Workforce Investment Area Number 1, which is out in the coal fields, to help train and place people in these health information technology fields. And the last thing that we have ongoing right now uh, is a grant that just got started. It's called the Valley's OJT Initiative. Um, I got contacted several months back by the Shandor Valley Whip. And uh, the director there wanted to apply for a large $5 million grant for this program. And she realized fairly quickly that there's no way that she in her area alone could, could do this $5 million grant. So she reached out to the Roanoke Web and to me and asked if we wanted to partner so that we would actually have a grant that ran in, interstate from end to end, starting in Bristol and running all the way till it runs out in, in, in the northern part of the state. And she was awarded the grant. Shenandoah Valley is the grant recipient. And we will have a staff person that will be on, have a four-year grant that will be working with, uh, with your more higher-tech advanced manufacturing companies. Uh, this program also has the flexible reimbursement rate as the NEGOJT. Uh, WA is only 50%. This one can go as high as 90 this one is designed not for entry-level people, but for someone that is already there and needs additional skills and upgrading to go to the next level. And we can assist them at, during this process to go from level one to two. We can also pay for associated training that the person may need. If they need a particular class, the employer, employer doesn't provide, we can pay for that. Uh, and, and this plus other things, we've got a skills gap analysis that we're trying to get off the ground, similar to a community audit we did back in 2002 when Annette was there. Uh, and we really have a lot of things ongoing. Um, and, and I give all the credit to our uh, elected officials. Uh, David Hutchins with Carroll County is our chair and, and Bill is our vice chair. And, uh, they, they're a driving force. Uh, I know Marty Holliday, uh, the deputy director, spends lots of her time in all of this initiative, uh, venturing out, trying to see what we can bring in. Uh, and the real focus now with, the, with all the boards are really identifying what are the workforce needs in our area? What skills do our, do our workers possess? What skills do they lack? What skills do, are the business community looking for currently? What skills are needed to bring new businesses in so that we can help equip our people with the skills necessary not only to go to work now, but to meet the needs of businesses that may want to come in. Uh, business may contact, uh, say, Eric Boff at the Alliance and want to know about how many of such and such do you have. We want to be able to identify that so that we actually can get people trained to meet, that, meet those needs. Uh, we have a, a website, and I would encourage you, when you get an opportunity, to go take a look and see what type of information is there. Uh, and I also put at your seat uh, a little pamphlet about Virginia Workforce Connection. This is a statewide database that actually is for not only job seekers, uh, but it's for businesses. Um, you can access labor market information through this. 
Uh, people can post the resumes, employers can look at resumes. Uh, if you get a chance, check that out. And I know that was sort of a, a quick go through. I told him that before we started, but these, these programs really are so big and, and so all encompassing, you really could talk you know, a long time on them. I didn't want to take up any more of your time than necessary. I'll be glad to answer any questions or you can contact me at any time. My number's here. Uh, if there's anything that you want to get to the boards, uh, you can you know, convey through Bill. Uh, the elected officials meet every other month, the third Wednesday. They meet alternating months from the Workforce Investment Board. Uh, and then the web, the elected officials will meet, and then the web, and then on and on. Uh, and so each one of them, at each time, has a connection. Uh, Martha Samples, that chairs the web from Radford, she meets with the elected officials every time and updates them on the board. David Hutchins is actually a business rep from Carroll County. He's on the web and updates the web every meeting on the elected officials. Uh, and so there's a good connectivity and an excellent working relationship. So Bill had wanted uh, to me to come and just, just let you guys know what all's going on. Most people I don't think realize all the things we're involved in now. Uh, and things are really flowing well. This next year that we're in is uh, we should be good. Funding-wise, of course, once the election happens, you know, we really don't know. The Workforce Investment Act has been up, up for reauthorization since 2003. So it's been long overdue, but there's a lot of serious talk now about reauthorizing. So there could be some significant changes on the horizon for PY13. Uh, but Bill will keep you updated, I'm sure. So thank you very much. I'll answer any questions you might have. Questions? Comments? I just had a quick question. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about placement rates. Uh, yeah, uh, typically right now, uh, we just did our year-end numbers. We are running with our dislocated worker program uh, over 80%. Our adult program usually will run around low to mid-70s, and our youth program is right around 70. Um, so, and, and the dislocated worker program usually is going to be higher you've got a different level person. A dislocated worker is usually somebody that has a good work history. You know, they're very dependable, hard working, but maybe the plant closed. And now all of a sudden they need to get retrained. So our replacement rates are always better with them, but I think in the 70s for the others are, are very good considering people have multiple barriers and, you know, a lot of issues. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, comments? I was going to say, um, New River Community College works very closely because he's th that's, that's the right. agency that does the training primarily, right? Bill, uh, we, we have a very close relationship with all three community colleges. We deal with New River, Withville, and Virginia Highlands, and, and have worked with them very closely. A lot of our clients take classes at those three. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we do we use proprietary facilities, too. But typically, they, they have a lot of the course offerings that the people need, and they're very flexible about developing you know, what you need. If we needed something specific for a group of people, they, they would develop it. They're, they're very easy, and they would do it very quickly. Yeah, all of the community colleges, not just New River, yeah. but I'm Excellent more familiar with that one than, yeah. than others. Yeah, I do you have, I know you have a lot of things for average workers out here that uh, have been working on. What do you have for uh, college educated people who got their education, find out they have not got the skills really to get the jobs that are around if there are? Uh, what kind of help can we give those folks? Um, our, the, our help is limited. Uh, that's one reason the elected officials wanted us to venture out into new arena. The Workforce Investment Act has specific eligibility criteria, which really ties your hands in a lot of cases. Uh, anybody, regardless of their situation, can access core services. They can go in our center and get help with a resume. Uh, they can get assistance in job search initiatives, uh, basic type of services. Uh, but unless they fit into one of these other groups that I mentioned, there really isn't anything we can do with the WA. Now, some of these other programs, like the Creates and Height, uh, if there was someone who had a college degree and, and it wasn't marketable and they wanted to go into these areas, 
we can train them without any problems. Uh, the other grants are the only ones that we can sort of help that particular group with. Any other questions or comments? This, some of you may be familiar with the old Job Corps and then the, what is it, the JTPA? Uh, this is the new thing that came in 1998 that really had a foundation in these yeah, other two. And really, you know, the employment and training initiatives go back to the mid-60s under Lyndon Johnson. The first was the Manpower Development and Training Act. And then you've had multiple programs over the years each one typically is employment and training, but, but they each have variances. Uh, was, they were handled different, offered different things. This latest one was the, was the one that broadened the horizon more than any of them. Uh, and, and it's a good concept. What you're looking at now in Congress is really trying to put this back into more like of an adult stream or all employment and training. Uh, they want to even include the Employment Commission, Wagner Pfizer, with all of our programs and the, the Trade Act Assistance Program, they want to make it a block grant and hand it to the states. And we're really not sure how that's going to work. Uh, so it's almost like they broadened it and spread it out, and now they're trying to bring it back in. Go ahead, Mary. Um, what percentage of your clients are veterans that are having trouble finding jobs, or do you know? I, I, believe, I would mm -hmm. just be guessing. Um, I would say probably for our program not high. Now I know we serve quite a few veterans in our centers and everyone has a veterans representative mm -hmm. present, but lots of those typically don't come over to our arena. They can. It's just the number isn't, isn't a high percentage. Thank you. Well, Ronnie, I'm glad that you came and, and, and brought us up to date on workforce investment uh, because uh, if I had tried to do what you've done under one of my board reports, we would still be here. Uh, but, on, but on behalf of uh, the Board of Supervisors of Montgomery County, we'd like to thank you thank for you. coming and sharing thank that you. information with us. And personally, you do a great job. Thank you. Appreciate your support. Thank you, Mike. It's in Good to see you. Okay. Uh, need a motion to go into work session? So moved. Second. Would the clerk call the roll? Ms. Biggs? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Mr. Cree? Aye. Ms. Purvis? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Mr. Aye. And the work se session will deal with animal management issues. And, well. Okay. All right. Um, we sort of had a tag team match this evening with um, several presentations. So at your place, you sit, should see this one should be first, and there should be two behind that. Um, we were asked to sort of review the building and feasibility study that was done three plus years ago which talked about and did some costs and recommendations and findings for the animal shelter. What I'm going to do is just sort of go over base, the same basic presentation I did about three years ago, um, just reviewing the, the high points of what that particular report said. We were also asked about the $30,000 that staff had recommended uh, to go to the Mountain View Humane Spay and Neuter Clinic and how might that be used and um, also advertised. And so Kelly Cass, the director of the clinic, is here tonight and she's going to do a presentation about how that funding may be used should the board approve that. And I will point out that there is a resolution on your agenda tonight to appropriate those funds as well. The last item that um, we were asked to look at is um, we were asked for the volunteer group to look at the Shawsville Elementary School in terms of how that might fit for a site for the animal shelter and Jason Shelton is here on behalf of the Friends of Animal Care and Control and he'll be talking about the tour and visit of that facility. 
So um, I will also point out if anyone in the audience wants copies of the presentations, they're over here on the table with the clerk. Okay, that's it. We'll get started here. We entitled this work session as Animal Management Issues because there are a number of issues involved other than just the shelter when you talk about managing the overpopulation of animals. The community, in fact, had raised a number of issues. You move it, it cuts out. Okay. Apparently it cuts back on some way. I'll try and keep away from it. Um, the community actually has raised a number of issues over the years. Um, the, one of which um, we've heard much about is the extremely poor conditions of the 30 years plus existing shelter, which only houses dogs. We've also heard about the need to control the overpopulation, particularly of cats, and this is a little chart I think Kelly's used a number of times in some of her presentation about what ends up happening when you have uncontrolled breeding. We've also heard from the community about the inability to house cats due to the lack of the shelter. We've also heard from some groups who don't believe cats, particularly feral cats, should be accepted in the new shelter, and that's largely because of the extremely high euthanasia rates that often occur at the shelters. It's because of the euthanasia rates for the most part, and any number of times I'm sure you've witnessed some of our neighboring communities, either on the news or in the newspaper, about community citizens and others and groups who are also concerned about the high euthanasia rate. I think the most recent one was in Roanoke County at their particular shelter. Part of the answer to addressing some of those issues comes from not one but a, a number of different programs. Spay neuter services is one and we are quite fortunate to have the clinic here. I think at this point in time we did this presentation last time we didn't have the clinic open. Community education is a big part of it as well as very aggressive adoption programs. But the bottom line is there's no one solution that fixes it. It's not the shelter that fixes all of it. It's not the clinic that fixes all of it. It's Bay neuter services, sheltering and adoption, community education, programs for the outdoor management of populations, all of those together are part of the solution and they don't happen without extremely intense volunteer support. That's really what makes these programs work. As I mentioned, staff recommended, and it's on your agenda for approval tonight, $30,000 for a pilot program for spay and neuter. And I'm going to ask Kelly to come up here now and tell you a little bit about how that program would work. I might be able to do this. Let me see. You gotta love technology. Hello, everyone. Hi. I'm going to recap a few things that we've talked about before just to um, jog everyone's memory. Every year in America, we spend about $2 billion catching, housing, and euthanizing and disposing of homeless animals, which averages about $250 per animal. That's, that's the average for the entire country. For every child that's born in America, seven puppies and kittens are born. And that tells us very quickly we're not gonna adopt our way out of the problem. As hard as we may try and as many animals as we want to save, we're not gonna adopt our way out of the problem. Um, we've realized over the last couple of decades that pet overpopulation isn't just an owner problem or a shelter problem or a veterinarian problem, it's the community's problem. The entire community has to deal with it as an entity. Sterilization, we believe, is the best defense against all sources of overpopulation. Everything else that we're asking to do as far as the shelter and all of the other actions, the TNR that happens throughout America, all of those things are reactions. They're not really defensive. Sterilization, the community education of that is really the best defensive action we have. Um, sterilization also minimizes health risk and cost for caring for unwanted animals. 
So far at Mountain View, and this was as of the end of the week, last week, we did a few more today. We've done 8,637 surgeries in a period of about two years. 47% uh, of those are animals that reside in Montgomery County or they resided here when they had surgery. S statistics have shown throughout um, the last several years that for every thousand procedures performed at a low cost clinic that could not have been performed otherwise, about half as many animals will never show up in a shelter over time. And that's an important statistic when we look at how it affects um, the county as a whole. 36%, and this is a new number for you guys, 36% of the animals that live in Montgomery County had owners who couldn't afford our price. And our price is anywhere from $45 to $65 um, just for the surgery itself <coughs> with other fees for vaccinations and such. So 36% of the animals that we saw had some sort of assistance. The assistance typically is in the $40 to $47 range depending on cat or dog and leaves the owner paying about $15. In some cases, we're doing cats for free. In some cases, we're doing cats for a dollar, thanks to a grant that we've gotten from PetSmart Charities. Um, but that doesn't cover the entire county. PetSmart was very specific about where they wanted to address. Spay and neuter services as a whole, we need to advocate that to our public as much as we can. We do a lot of marketing. We've hung doorknob hangers on houses. We've asked college students to distribute literature. We're this close to going to the pizza companies and asking, asking those to them to put flyers on their delivery boxes. We're doing everything we can to put a piece of paper in someone's hand to say, help us help you. Um, we are also on the brink of having some TV advertising. We've done radio PSAs for a long time. We'll be doing some more of that. So we're trying everything we can and we just ask that you help us to encourage people to be responsible with their pets and sterilize them. But if an owner can't afford the sterilization, we want to make sure that we can do it anyway. And that's what we're asking for your help tonight, is to provide the subsidy funding we need to, to get cats in other areas of the county, as well as um, the area that PetSmart serves, to try to encourage those people to be able to get it done as cheaply as they can get it done. Local rescues, we serve a tremendous number of local rescues. They've done a tremendous job. A lot of them do trap feral cats. Um, and they encourage owners of cats to bring their cats in. A lot of them will go to their houses and pick them up and bring them to us if the person can't, can't get out of their house, if they're homebound. So we have a lot of rescues that work with us to try to serve the population. But our goal is to turn no one away. And right now we have been very blessed in private donations to be able to do that to some degree. When we first opened, we weren't able to do that if someone called and I told them it was $45 to fix a male cat if they couldn't afford it. I couldn't do anything. Now it depends on where they live and whether or not we have a grant outstanding for that area. Right now I have no money for Radford, for instance. So there are places that we have the ability to help, places where we have the ability to help very little, and places where we don't have the ability to help at all. So how we would use this money? And this is based on exactly what we are currently doing with PetSmart. This is what PetSmart has found in their years of expertise to be a good solution, a good way to use funds to get the best benefit out of it. All cats living in Montgomery County would be subsidized to the tune of $28. And for a free feral cat, which is a free roaming cat that has to be trapped, it's not friendly enough for you to pick it up. If you try, you probably won't trap twice. So, um, for a free roaming cat that has to come in a trap and gets ear tipped, if you're not familiar with that, what that is, they clip off the top of one ear so animal control can see that animal and know it's been vaccinated and fixed. So for an animal that's in a trap and gets ear tipped, the owner would pay a dollar. And the owner is the person who brings the animal to me and says, I would be responsible for this animal. Free roaming cats that are friendly, that come in a carrier, the owner um, has been feeding it at the back door and it's friends, but they don't really live in their house. Um, and they still are willing to get it ear tipped would cost $11. And the difference in the price is primarily because now my staff have to take the risk of handling the cat and doing a more thorough exam before anesthesia and all of those types of things. So we spend more time with cats that don't come in traps. And then house cats would cost the owner about $25 for a male and $30 for a female. In those cases, it does not include a rabies vaccine. And that's because so many of the people that we see are doing the right thing by their cats by getting them vaccinated. But when their veterinarian tells them how much it's going to cost them to get their animal fixed, they say, I can't afford it. And so a lot of the local vets realize 
we're a one-stop service. We're not going to steal their customer. So they'll say, well, if you can't afford this, you really need to get it done. Go see Mountain View Humane. And so they'll send them to us. So they've already got vaccinations, and they call and say, hey, so-and-so told me to come see you. And then we send them right back to their regular veterinarian for continued care, which is what we would really like to see every animal be able to get. So that's how we would use that funding. And this is kind of a comparison for the first number and the last numbers. If a locality spends at minimum $120 to care for an unwanted animal. Now remember the average for all of America is $250. So this is really a conservative estimate. And you spend that same $120 to fund five surgeries. You would save at least two animals from coming in the shelter. So you spend $120 to save a minimum of $240. So it makes financial sense. It makes uh, community sense. It's good for the community, it's good for the health of the community, it's good for the overall morale of the community, it's good for people to enjoy where they live. And that's a little, that's the basis of the money part. The other things that we ask everyone to do is support our animal control officers. Animal control has done a phenomenal job since we have been here of helping us spread the word. We give them postcards, they give them out to people that they see in the community that need it. Their shelter staff, the shelter manager, Shannon, um, also works for Mountain View part-time, so she's really good at helping us with distributing our information. So we will, really want to try to promote this as much as we can throughout the community. This is a picture of where I brag on animal control and the shelter and Friends of Animal Care and Control. Every year, at the end of the year, they have a number of spay and neuter contracts where people have adopted dogs and never got the dog fixed. Last year, they didn't have any incompletes. They were 100% done. So they stuck this post-it note in their folder so they wouldn't think they just messed up and didn't put the information in the folder. So it says, there are no incomplete files for this year. So we took a picture of that. So we're very happy with that, happy that we can contribute to that. Any questions? Anything I can answer for anyone? I have a comment. Okay, um, supervisor. As you know, yeah, as you know I've, I've been a supporter of your program from the very beginning, and we actually used your program. Oh, yeah. My husband brought in a cat, um, I guess over a week ago, Tripod, the oh, three legged cat. Yeah. Um, that sort of has adopted our yard as her yard. Mm hmm. And uh, after seeing her play around with some other male cats a couple times, and we finally were able to catch her, and you guys did an excellent job. Great. I want to thank you, and uh, um, he said it was a really good experience. Great. We, we strive to treat everyone that walks through the door the same. Um, my past experience was in food pantries, and it was so sad to see folks come in feeling like they deserve to be treated like less than other people because they had no money or because they couldn't afford your services. And, and we're, we're, we do not do that. And that's one thing that I, I preach is treat every person that comes in like a relative, a relative you like, and treat every animal like it's yours. And so if you, if you come by the clinic and take a tour, and I welcome you to do that at any time, half of us are talking in baby talk because that's mm -hmm. how I talk to my dog, so that's how I'm going to talk to your dog. Um, we have a dog there today, a pit bull named Champ, and everybody's been ooing and gooing over him because he's the sweetest thing, and he kind of goos when he's when he's a little concerned about what's going on. Mm -hmm. So we talk about, talk to Champ a lot and keep him feeling good. But um, one thing that we have done for cats like that, um, we've switched to a new, it's probably not new, new to us, um, long-acting pain medication. So in a cat situation where it's being released back outside, it's three days worth of pain medication in one injection. And a lot of spay neuter clinics have not been able to go to that because of the cost. But um, once you hit a certain volume, you can get a better discount. So we've been able to go to that. We're very pleased to be able to offer that. And you can tell by the way the cats act the next morning before they leave that they feel so much better. Well, she was definitely happy. She still is. They are. <laughs> They're very happy when they leave. It's, it's not over medication. They just don't feel any pain. Any other questions? Yeah, I, I have a few. Um, in regards to the $30,000, do you believe, how many animals do you believe you'll be able to treat Probably 1,000 to 1,100. Okay. And then you understand that what's currently proposed is one-time money. This yes, is. I understand. Okay. Mm -hmm. We would like to see it continued, obviously, but um, we, we have our own funding. We're constantly going after grant funding from a variety of private sources. This is the only thing we've ever seen from a government that I can ever remember. 
um, but we get grants from a lot of other private sources. But they're they're very specific in what they want to do. Um, we have one that's strictly for Floyd County, and it's almost always a private citizen who lives in that area who wants to fund their neighbors. Um, and what the only thing we've gotten like that in Montgomery County is a bequest we got from Dr. George Inger, who worked at Virginia Tech. Um, but his his funding, while we're happy to have it, is um, primarily in assets that cannot be liquidated for three to five years. So while it looks really good on the books and it's nice and pretty, <laughs> we can't actually do anything with it. Um, our hope is that when um, the county decides what they're doing with the shelter, and I'm sure you'll see on the map that Carol has, it's got future clinic on it. Our hope is that that funding could be used to build our clinic next to the shelter if the stars align and time works out and you know, all of that. So that's what we're looking for that money to do, but we can't get to it for a little while. Um, in regards to your, obviously you're a 501-3C. Correct. And, C3. Mm -hmm. and what is roughly your administrative cost versus uh, your operations cost? And your we have bed? very low administrative cost. We have uh, myself and, and two full-time office staff and one part-time office staff. Everyone else that we employ is medical. We currently have a full-time veterinarian. We have part-time veterinarians who come in when needed. We have two LVTs full-time, which is a licensed veterinary technician. That's the person who can induce and do drugs and things like that. Um, and then we have a full-time veterinary assistant. The rest of the work that's done at the clinic is done by volunteers. We have volunteers who come in and do our laundry. They scrub instruments. They make surgical packs. They help us with sterilizing things. Um, so they, they come in and do all of that. We have some that come in and help with paperwork. It's, so it's very volunteer driven as far as it can be. Medically, it's kind of tough to be volunteer driven to some degree. Um, you had also mentioned that there was areas that PetSmart's grant was not covering and you had mentioned Radford. Obviously, these funds would not be utilized. Oh, no, absolutely. Okay. No, the PetSmart grant is for three specific census tracts, all of which are in Montgomery County. Okay. Um, the other areas in Montgomery County, PetSmart's not covering, and PetSmart, very much like you're saying, with this money, we're not guaranteed to continue getting it. So we're trying to do a one-hit knockout and try to do as many cats as we can possibly do in the next year to two years, and then see where we are and see what we still need to do at that time, and then we can continue to apply for PetSmart grants and anything else that's out there. This program, I, I've heard cats, but every once in a while dogs mentioned, is it primarily this $30,000 is going to be used towards spaying and neutering of cats? The 30000 from my understanding, as the staff recommended, was strictly for cats. And we'll use it however you want us to use it. We, we make a joke, especially when we're talking to private donors, that if you want me to just use it for red-headed firemen, I can make that happen. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you give me the money, I can find somebody who needs it. It's just that easy because they walk in my door every day or they call me on the phone every day. So, yeah, we can. The, the two firemen in the back, I think, got a little bit nervous when you mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't remember it. <laughs> Uh, it, 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 it was staff's recommendation that this be used as a as a program to help address the feral cat issue yeah, because the at the at the shelter now we just don't have a ability to handle cats so right, that was right. the thought of staff. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any other questions? Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. I'll let you deal with that. Thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, from here on I'm going to um, just review some of the findings from the actual needs assessment feasibility and building program. The study was done by Shelter Planners of America and Shelter Planners is a company and that's all they do is shelters. Their company is actually located in California. We were somewhat fortunate to be able to get Bill Mead to do this study because he's actually from Lynchburg. Um, he was in this area visiting family and also doing a study for Roanoke County. He's consulted with a number of Virginia localities here and we were quite fortunate to get him. He was with the National Humane society for over a decade before he even opened his own company. He's been in this business for a long time of designing shelters. 
part of what they talk about, and I'm not going to read all of this, but in general, uh, they focus around how to address the problem in their concept in shelter design. And part of what they talk about are spay neuter requirements, um, public education, progressive ordinances, and well promoted adoption programs. This is what Kelly was referring to in terms of the site map. This is the site that was identified and included in the report, which um, pulls to the front of the property where the animal shelter is currently located, but relocates this to the front for visibility with the 460 bypass. The idea was at the time this was put together, the relocation of the county garage facility utilization of that area fronting the bypass for the front of the shelter and then including with that and you see with it, it's just um, a box there included for future clinic but the idea is to co was to co-locate that clinic along with the shelter facility and there were some preliminary discussions with Virginia Tech Vet School about being able to utilize vet students at both the clinic and for shelter medicine for the animals there also. The need, and this was extract, these um, pictures and comments were extracted from the report which shows the existing facility, um, its need for replacement, the kennels which were uh, fairly old design, poor drainage, low quality, this was a view of the adoption kennel, and as you can see, it's not particularly enticing for people, and I, I think that's one of the things that um, Bill Mead and shelter planners focus on. A, a lot of things in an animal shelter facility are designed to attract people. You want people coming in to volunteer, and people coming in to adopt, and people coming in to provide programs and services. This photo is of the outside where it's just um, nearly impossible to clean these particular runs. The report findings also talk about uncontrolled breeding. Kelly talks some about what services she offers. Some calculations that were included in the report is that nationally about 3% of your population translates into the number of animals turned into a shelter annually. At this point in time, we were looking upward at 89,000. We didn't have the new census numbers when this was done. And then projecting out for 111,000, which would give us about a little over 3,300 animals. Well, now we're over 93,000 people. So we're closely approaching the 111,000 as we speak. A new facility would be able to strengthen programs, again, the focus being on increasing adoptions and return to owners to the highest possible level. Programs include spay-neuter, which obviously is a, a very needed service and one we're, we're happy to have in our area. Owner education, foster uh, homes for pets, well-designed websites which um, allow people to look at animals and be able to come in and do adoptions more readily and an ongoing well-promoted adoption program which requires lots of intensive volunteer help because you need to be open after five o'clock and on the weekends. The facility is um, designed and the report would include seven primary functions, the reception and sales of pet supplies and what they recommend is you have some area to sell pet supplies which generates revenue stream that's then used for the programs. Administrative education areas such as classroom and meeting rooms, again the design of the facility was to encourage people and allow the volunteer groups to have a place to be, a place to come and become a part of the facility. Receiving areas, kennels, quarantine and a clinic for shelter animal care and now with the potential of combining with the spay neuter clinic there are more options available about how to do that. Again that's where the preliminary discussions with Virginia Tech came into play about how to use 
vet students, since they're always looking for places to be able to practice shelter medicine in the vet school. Modern shelters are designed to include, and again, it's central pressure washing equipment, watering systems, flushing floor drains, purification. All these types of things are around ways to do a couple of things, one of which is to be able to have the easiest cleaning possible for the management of disease. It also reduces your labor costs in the long term. It doesn't take as many people to keep it clean. And you're also trying to have the most pleasant environment to encourage volunteers in the public. The space allocated, these are the numbers as they designed them and again with the help of our um, friends of animal care and control and our animal control officers, these were the uh, rooms that were identified or the areas and the types of areas necessary for the facility to house both dogs and cats. And these were how the estimates were calculated. Construction only was estimated at about 2.5 million, and here's how they made their calculations. At that point in time, it was $160 a square foot for a number of the areas. Uh, for the kennels, you were looking at a more costly $200 a square foot. Whether or not that's the appropriate number now, I don't know. Um, this was probably all 2008 construction numbers at the time they were done. What we've experienced here recently is um, the cost of construction coming in much less than we had initially anticipated from 2008 numbers. But I don't know whether or not that would be the number at this point. The $30 a square foot you're looking at outside runs and that's um, the reason that's so a lesser cost. 20% was what was plugged in for uh, site work, civil, A&E fees, permits, 5% contingency. All that adds up to 3.1 million. We've been using 3.5 over the years, building in cost increased. And as I said, I don't know if it's increased. I don't know if it's gone down. And until we actually have a design and start putting it on the street, I'm not sure we'll know if those numbers are less or not. Again, the planned new shelter provides attractive new quarters for cats, helping to increase adoption levels. And quite honestly, I don't think the cats care if it's attractive. I think the attractive part is for the people, and that's what it's all about, is trying to encourage the people to come in and to adopt as many animals as possible. That would be the goal, finding a responsible owner for every adoptable pet. We asked shelter planners to give us an artist rendering. We wanted to use that in terms of a capital campaign where you need a pretty picture to be able to go out and ask for donations. They placed this on the site area where we had identified a potential for the animal shelter site, and this is actually the city of Harrisonburg and Rockingham County's actual shelter. Um, both the city and the county support that facility. And again, the focus of all of the design, the report, and everything was adoption. So that's sort of a review of the information that we were given in the report. I think most of you have an actual copy of the report. If you don't and you would like a full copy of the report, I'll be happy to get those to you. I have a copy that was distributed in 09, and I think you guys don't, do you? Did you get one? Yes. Oh. And then I came to either meeting previously with maybe other Running. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, this is uh, all I have to present. Jason's going to talk about the volunteers tour at the Just, school, but yeah, if this, you this have go right along with maybe, maybe you could have. I don't see anywhere here where they have the cost of tearing the building down. No. And with the schools being torn down as much as they cost, uh, that can get quite expensive. Uh, this, this estimate does not include 
relocation of the garage. It does not include that. That would be a separate item. So yeah, taking right. the building down two and... Two or three things. That's not included. You are probably talking about $2 million worth that's not included. So... Mm -hmm. Is that... Moving the whole... Um, well, right. when the, my I understanding... Do not, it does not include that, and I don't yeah. have an estimate. When the county acquired the get my bearings when the county acquired the property behind this building the the former off property one of the my understanding is one of the long-range plans for that property was to look at some point moving the garage operations consolidating the garage PSA operations everything back here so we would have more of a campus like setting but you're correct there is no money set aside for that project kind of related to that um, I was wondering if on slide 19 where it was talking about the, it says that the estimates don't include an increase in operating costs or staffing had any work been done to estimate what the ongoing costs would be for this new facility as far as new staff overhead I'll have to go back and look at the report I believe it did okay. do some staffing okay um, that including additional animal control officers for picking up cats um, also some staffing again part of the design was around trying to minimize the cleaning staff needed and use volunteers where possible but I'll look back in that and see if I can find what they presented in terms of staff I, that's what I'm thinking it was I just can't remember what it was off the top of my and head and when you were helping me in regards to providing budget numbers one of the things that run a county their numbers were approximately double what our numbers were for animal control because they do shelter cats um, and, and control cats. Uh, and it, if I remember, it's almost exactly double what our animal control costs were. It probably I mean, so. It's a, part, when I say double, like 10, 20,000, something along those lines, it seems like. It was at least 250,000 more, I think. Um, now, how many more officers and are we comparing? like to like in terms of everything they do I don't know but you're right and they do serve a little bit larger area I'm not sure if they pick up for Benton or Benton does their own I, I know that Benton is part of the shelter group but I want to say Bottle Top is also part of that shelter group but it is and, and, and Bottle Top we're at County Road City and Benton and they uh, they each have their own animal control officers but they share the shelter and, and if, if I remember Roanoke County's numbers I it may be on there still that the, my slideshow presentation and it, it had that number um, in regards to animal control but you provided that and I think we can find it fairly easy yeah we'll we'll look it up and get it out to everybody if everyone would like to have that again also uh, just for comment where you know if I'm not a hundred percent mistaken uh, our two animal control people, one lives in Reiner and the other one lives in Shawsville. So, you know, when it comes to people traveling for distances, which is what was used here in the other ones. Well, did, and maybe you're not the right person to ask in regards to, there was some conversations about asking the volunteers about how they would feel about the shelter moving to Shawsville, utilizing. That's next. Okay. Yeah, as soon as I sit down, then Jason's <laughs> going to get up and um, talk about his tour of the facility as a volunteer. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, or girl? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> the uh, the first thing I'll do is apologize for flip flops and all that. The, we had a five hour drive that turned into six and a half. So I was happy to have the FACC shirt handy, so you didn't have to see me in a tie dye tonight. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we are. Um, we did go. We went down to the uh, as a request. We went down to Shawsville Elementary and we, we toured that building on. June 20th, and some things, uh, it was myself and Carol, 
and Kelly went down with us uh, just to give a little background information. Kelly does have a degree in engineering, I have a degree in civil engineering, so we have, she's also worked with a number of engineering firms. Um, so we're just trying to take through a quick assessment of a walkthrough and get an idea of what, you know, what that site looks like from a site perspective, but then also how does it impact from where we're talking about location-wise, how does that impact adoptions, volunteer program, all those other factors. So that's kind of what we're going to cover here. So looking at the building, the existing conditions when you walk through, uh, we did have site plans that were from whenever the, sh whenever the building was built, it still had things like septic fields on there and all that. It does have, uh, I know that it does have uh, public sewer and public water there. Uh, the, the staff member who gave us the tour informed us of that. They have uh, the only place that we could find floor drains we're in the kitchen, so um, as far as actually getting something up to what would be needed for an existing shelter, you would have to completely redo the floor, the plumbing on the floor, rip that up. You would have to have you would have to redo the, the slope of the floor so you had correct slope that went down to the drains because you want to have the way we're looking to design the shelter is you want to have a drain per run so that you don't have the current, if you go to the current shelter and you see the way the current shelter is constructed, you have a trough drain system and that trough drain system allows the, all of the sewage to go right through, right by every other kennel. And when that happens, you have a higher chance of disease spreading and, and all kinds of stuff that happens. Parvo runs rampant at the current shelter, and it's something that we try to combat as much as we can, but you're never going to get it all. So um, these, these are things, you know, the, certainly the, the flooring issue there, uh, there would be, be a whole host of that that would have to happen. HVAC would be the second thing that would have to happen because you would have to have separate HVAC systems for the different population areas in the shelter. And you look at that to also control disease. So we look at things like kennel cough. In the existing shelter, the dogs face each other. The dog gets kennel cough. The entire shelter gets kennel cough. In a shelter, in a, in a new shelter, where we talk about building one, we would have an isolation area. So when one dog developed kennel cough, that dog would be removed from the general population, put into an isolation area, and then we could control the antibiotics and eventually introduce that dog back into the general population. So those are the two major pieces on that site. Anything to add? That's the biggest. Yeah. Um, I, I think as far as a location, you know, we're talking about taking a facility that is located centrally in a population center of the county next to um, 460 bypass, easy access to 81, you have easy access to adjacent counties, and then you're talking about moving it out to an edge part of the county and I don't think you have to look really any farther than Giles County to realize what happens when you have a shelter that exists out in a further part of the county. They're actually looking, Kelly, what, what did the, you said they were looking to... The Giles County Animal Rescue Group is currently raising money to move their shelter. Um, I, I think the difference in time is about 20 minutes, but the current one is off of a major four-lane highway, but it's off of it far enough that you would never see it and wouldn't know it was there unless um, you tried to get there. And it's not a four-lane, it's not the major four-lane, it's not 460. It's another, it's, I think it's route 100. It's off of 100, so it's not major. So they're trying to raise enough money to move their shelter from that location to route 460. And that's somewhere near Parisburg, I think is what they're... Right beside Giles County High School, that's where yeah. they're aiming for. Okay. So when we look at the adoption and reclaim, right, just went through the last two years for Giles County, and I'll show you Montgomery County's stats on the next page. Obviously, I can't show you stats in Montgomery County, but just looking at what happens when you have a shelter that's out there, their adoption and reclaim rates are extremely low, um, extremely low for cats. And then when you look at their transfer to rescue groups, their, their, rest, their transfer rates are excellent, actually. But that's because you have a dedicated volunteer group that is out there busting their butt every day trying to make sure that they have a collaboration with not only the rescue groups that are local, but rescue groups that are out of state, and they're doing all of the effort to get those animals out of that shelter. And what, what I don't what I would not want to see us turn into is something something that had to invest that much volunteer effort into transferring those dogs out. We need to have more 
community involvement. It needs to be more community owned. So when we look at our adoption or adoption and reclaim rates and transfer rates, we do have you know a quarter of our dogs are transferred, but it's not nearly the 63% that we're talking about that, that Giles has. And the, the adoption rates are excellent in our area, you know, 65%, 56%. Uh, that's what we want to see. That's what we want to continue to see and continue to build on. <coughs> when we look at our volunteer base, our volunteer base is a large majority Virginia Tech students. So we have, um, you know, they can get to to uh, the the, uh, the shelter in about you know five or ten minutes. Um, when we talk about moving out to Shawsville, you're talking about a 30 minute one way trip, and that right there destroys so much ability to be able to attract the volunteers to get out there. And when we talk about collaborating with Virginia Tech. The Animal Welfare Foster Program, they have a group of volunteers who are vet students, so they, they foster dogs, they pull dogs from us regularly. When they pull dogs from us, they're, you know, we call them and they're there between classes. So when they, have, when they have to come between classes, if they have a short amount of time, hour and a half, they get out here, they evaluate some dogs as quickly as they can and they take the dogs they're going to get, they get them to the foster home they have to get to, and they've got to get to the next class. Moving it out to a further location is just going to really inhibit that um, ease of collaborating with those kind of groups. The other piece is, uh, you know, since the beginning of this, we've always talked about co-locating with Mountain View, Mountain View Humane at some point in the future, and you can speak more to to our location. Um, we chose where we are for two major reasons, Interstate 81 and 460. If we could have afforded it, we would have been right at that intersection because that's our biggest um, feature is the fact that we run a transport program that covers many counties and that's part of the way we keep our fees low is with the volume that we do. In fact, that's the major way we keep our fees low. We have an organization of 90-some spay and neuter clinics that we collaborate with throughout the United States that we learn from. At least one is trying to relocate, um, and it's actually the one in Evington. If you've never heard of Evington, it's a spot in the road south of Lynchburg. They got free land and thought, let's just build it on the free land, or they got it rental for a dollar or something really low. And turned out it was a horrible idea because no one can find them, no one knows where they are, and they're trying to relocate in Lynchburg. So we wanted to be at a major intersection and in a community um, where we felt like needed us. The closest spay neuter clinics to here is the one in Roanoke, Angels of Assisi, and the one in Bristol, Margaret B. Mitchell. So we wanted to be about halfway between, and we wanted to be along those two major highways. We originally looked right there at Roanoke Street, we couldn't afford it, frankly. The real estate there is expensive for a reason. And then we looked closer to the shelter. Um, and we looked at some buildings there and really couldn't find a building that suited our needs, which is how we ended up on Main Street. If we move at all, it's gonna be closer to 460 and, and Interstate 81, it, it won't be to Shawsville. For some of the same reasons that he cited, my customers can't find me, my clientele aren't gonna drive that far. I have a lot of people who get rides from friends. Um, we have the hopes of um, being able to do more transport and our volunteers are Christiansburg folks and, and vet, stu vet school students. And so if I move, I'm gonna lose my volunteer base and I can't afford that. And so let, let me say something before y'all keep stepping on your toes. Obviously, you don't know where the center of Montgomery County is. It would be east somewhere of well, Christiansburg. The population centers is well, what I said. I'm talking about where the center of Montgomery County, which is what you said. No, I said population centers. That's and what I'm talking about. For me, it's the center of transportation, which yeah. to me and is always If, the if you were to put it in the center of Montgomery County, then uh, Shawsville would be much closer to it than Blacksburg. But the population centers are Christiansburg and Blacksburg. I agree. That's what I said, population centers. And <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's back on, it's on the, is it on the current slide? Yeah. Yeah, populate 90% of our volunteers can come from the population centers yeah. of Montgomery County. But you spoke of it before that, and used the center of the county, period. Population centers. <laughs> but that ain't what it's there. Anyhow. <laughs> uh, 
Volunteers come to Shawsville every day to help with the Y. Every day. So, you know, the fact of getting volunteers is, you know, unless they don't like their job or are doing that as much as other people like. Uh, okay, so like I said, it's a 30 minute trip for most of our volunteers. They're not going to take an hour trip. To, it's, it's, you're going to lose more volunteers by that. And, and you know your volunteer much better than I, I do. Very much. Uh, the only thing that I would say is that I don't know whether you'd be interested in it or not, but there's a, a vacant new building right here on the interstate connector where the Harley Davidson shop was at. I know where that is. That seems to me might would lend itself and be cheaper than a little bit than uh, building one. At a place that if I was to tell somebody that didn't know where they were going, right now they probably couldn't find it. I don't know if the so Harley good. building would be, it is newer and, and I'm yeah. sure the HVAC is newer because if I remember correctly in Shawsville, the units were the original HVAC it was the original, units. Yeah. So well, yeah, I, just it was, I don't so know, I know it goes out now. I just figured that if it was good enough to choke for the children, of, mm -hmm. that we have, I, then it should be... Well, well it's not, it's, that's not the question. It's, it, the question is more about what you have to do in the construction of the shelters that we're right. talking about nowadays right. to, to deal with disease control and to right. deal... I mean, yeah. it's, not, it's not set up. It's just not set up. I know it's not set up. But yeah. you know... I, if you, I you have to go look at it and see what you got to do mm -hmm. to it mm -hmm. to make it set up. But you know, if you're looking at that New River Harley building and you're looking at moving your garage, that sounds like an easy fit, but that's just me, a non... <laughs> I haven't been in that building, don't know anything about that building, but surely but, they did garage work there. I mean, they worked on my you know, that, uh, that just kind of fits what you were saying that you would like to have beside them. Right. We, we love to be on a major highway. Uh, that, that's always... I think they have to be, and, and one of the things, they, they, there's actually been spadier clinics that located yeah. away from major thoroughfares, and, mm -hmm. and they failed and, miserably mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. or moved. That, that, if that Harley Davidson building would work, you can buy it. It's got parking. It's, I mean, everything is there. They only used it about a year and a half. Yeah, it hadn't been there very yeah, long. But if it's built to be a garage. Well, I, and I would say I would say another thing with the co-location piece. This is this is another critical part with the co-location piece is that we need to be able to have. It, it's just like when you have departments that are fragmented in whatever building you're in. You know, I, I work with tech, so we have departments that get fragmented all the time, and we're located in different buildings. The minute you co-locate a department. Mm -hmm you have more synergy and more availability and more ability to pull resources and do all of those things that you need to do to accomplish your mission. And so by, by being co-located, that would give Kelly the opportunity to actually tap into our volunteer base and right. help them. Right. And ha have us help them and then help us. And we do ask them for volunteers quite a bit. Um, when we have people who call us and say, I have cats at my house, but I'm 80 and I can't get out and trap them myself. We call <laughs> FACC, we call Animal Hope Alliance. And we say, can you help this woman trap? So we do tap into them for, for volunteers to hang doorknob hangers and all kinds of wonderful things. The other part that co-locating helps is, the, is to get Virginia Tech more involved. We have some wonderful programs with Virginia Tech. We have students in our office um, almost every day. We're working on programs to have them there much more often than we do now. We provide animals for their third year surgery rotation. So we do a tremendous amount of work with them as it is, and that would only bleed over into the clinic or into the sheltering situation if we were co-located. Uh, I, I am just simply looking for a, the best spot to do what you want to do for the least amount of money. Uh, and and we, yeah. it, it, we, appreciate, we appreciate the opportunity to go out and look at it and, and, to, and to check it out and see what, what, what we felt would be an idea. Obviously, in order to get a real thorough assessment, there would have to be some sort of feasibility study done on that building to make sure that it could even happen. You know, cause I'm not a structural engineer, so I can't speak to that. Um, I mean, you know, and certainly you would need a better cost than, than you know, I, I work for Virginia Tech now. I'm not, I'm not in an engineering firm. I'm not part of an a and &E. I, You know, I, I couldn't pull that kind of cost estimate together for you to be able to, to give you an answer like that on what it would cost to do that. Yeah. I can just give you, to the best of my knowledge, what it looks like when we go in there and that, that it, you know, from... Yeah, yeah and, and, you know, I was thinking the building very cheap and down there, but... It, that that part does not matter at all. I'm still looking for the best place 
for the cheapest money, and that Harley building just may be it. It may not be. It may be something you could not use. Yeah, I don't know if there's enough space there. I, I, don't, there I don't know what building I, you're talking about. Oh, I know where the building is. It's up behind Cracker Barrel up on the hill. I don't know. I haven't seen that. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I have no idea what land is there or anything. Yeah. And, and once again, because we've looked, you know, two years ago is when we put our, our clinic in. I can't imagine that being cheap, but right. I'd be shocked. Well, it's not going to be cheap, but. Right. Time you spend a couple million dollars on water to move what's there, tear it down, and get rid of it, and get the site back ready, that's not going to be cheap. It's going to be about five million dollars. Right. Right. But a shelter is such a very specific style of building that I can't imagine going into. And and you know, I've been out of engineering for almost three years now, but I can't imagine going into a building and doing demo and building back. And coming out any better than building new, I just I can't see it just because of how specific the building is. Now, if you're looking at something um, more like us, to where we don't need floor drains, we don't need you know we don't need a lot of the things that the shelter needs. That's why we did renovate a building. We didn't want to build a new building because it was going to be so much more expensive, and so we looked for a good place to renovate. But and I just I, can't imagine that in a shelter. I don't know how much that's got in it, but it, it may be that you could have all your offices, your spay and neuter, on what's there. Mm -hmm. And then build your runs and things for dogs in the back. Of it. I don't know. Yeah, I know but, yeah just just thought. So. Okay, Mr. Stuck has a question. I have one question. How many uh, at roughly now at the shelter are we averaging dogs that are present? I, I would have I, ball is no ballpark. I, I would have to go back and look. I mean, I would I would guess somewhere around a thousand dollars or a thousand a thousand a thousand dogs. Right now, but a thousand dollars. But how many runs do we have? That Thirty-six have? runs. So in Thirty-six time, runs that are operational. There, there are there are a set of upper runs that, that are not. That are not. They they were shut down by the state vet years ago. Right. So the only runs that are available are thirty-six runs. So we're looking at thirty-six animals there at any given time. Is that's the maximum? There, and, 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 and currently, currently, and the way the way that we operate is that. For the animal patrol officers to be able to operate on a daily basis, we, we have to ensure that there are five runs open at the beginning of the day for them to operate. So we've come to an agreement that there has to be a minimum of five runs open at the beginning of the day. What what impacts us also is the is the fact that, you know, court cases, bike cases, all those kind of things that have to run through the system and can sit there, literally sit there for two and three months at a time, we that that eats into the other dogs that are potentially adoptable. So, and it's not to say that those court cases are all bad or that they're not going to be reunited with their owner or whatever. They're just eating into what I feel like is my quota on what I, you know, I, I mean, I, I need to operate with giving giving them what they need to work, but then, so we, so that's where we come in with the rescue groups and animal welfare foster program and our own group, we have our own fosters and, and sometimes, unfortunately, euthanasia, so. Thank you. Oh, you want to continue with your summary? Oh, uh, that uh, that oh. was basically it. My, no, okay. you know, my last slide here was just for for us looking at this. It really um, it, it was it doesn't seem like an ideal location just because of the the coordination with the rescue groups and the the, the coordination or the, the travel time for the volunteers and it, we've had feedback from volunteers where we don't feel like we would we would keep as many as we've had in the past. Um, I, I have done some things, I'm working on it right now, where I've taken the ACO travel logs and I'm comparing what the travel log would be from the existing location to what it would be in Shawsville and in every case that I've come up with so far, it's increased the daily time that they're going to spend responding to calls and getting back to the shelter. So you're going to look at increased prices and gas to, to get them wherever they need to get around the county to. Now I haven't completed that. but. I'm working on compiling that in a spreadsheet, looking at that. What's that for the for the dog wardens and staying? The dog wardens, the officer Ogle, officer Pittman, and Chief Helmick, looking at their daily logs that they keep. Mm -hmm. So track, tracking those and where they go and and what it would be from an origin point of the existing shelter, what would be from the origin point of the um, elementary school. Are you going to take into consideration where they live? 
Well, it's from, it's from starting at 8.30 at the shelter when they start and, and ending well, at the start, shelter. They, they start at home because they have, have vehicles. Well, they, 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 start, they start at the shelter to respond to calls. So that's where... I could. Yeah. So that's, I mean, they, I could start from home, but I, it, it's really the, the start of the day starts when they're responding to calls from the shelter. So that's what we're looking at. So if they respond from home, they're not responding to call. I don't have to. I'm doing from 8.30 in the morning to, to 5 o'clock at night okay. is what I'm doing. I don't, I'm not doing their evening, their emergency calls that they get called out on because I know that's that's a totally different beast on on where they could get called. It's, there's not an origin point they're starting from. Any other questions, comments? I would like to talk about the Shawsville site a little bit more if we could in, in, while we're in work session. Yeah. My question, Gary, you're from there. And one of the things that, that has just been brought to my attention and it also made me think back one time when we had a flood down that way, I had my son uh, come down and he got to hold the Channel 7 microphone and I took pictures of him because there was a, a river running mm -hmm. and that you couldn't get to the school. Mm -hmm. Uh, but my understanding is in the flood of 85 they had to sandbag mm -hmm. the school to keep the water out. Is that is that is that right? Mm -hmm. They sandbagged the school but it would not have had to, it didn't get up high enough to get in the school. But when they took kids out, they um, carried some of the kids out because they carried them through water. Uh, well, I was just thinking we, if, and, and if we only have 30 or 40 or even if we double the numbers and we say we've got a couple hundred animals um, and it's in a floodplain, what do we do with them? Well, I mean, it's, water goes up and water goes down in a couple hours and it's done, so as, as we've ever seen, so I, I don't know. Uh, it, was, it was safe enough for our children, so I assume it would be safe enough for adults. And, and, and if I could just comment one thing on, on as far as emergency action plans, I don't, I don't know that we have one for the shelter currently. Maybe, you know, if there's, no. So as far as an evacuation plan for the shelter, I don't know that one exists even at the existing one. Certainly, if you put something in a floodplain, you're gonna to have to address that too, so. That, that was my only thoughts, it just, and it, it like well, said. Well, I don't think it's going to show me. I, that was just something I wanted to be checked out. However, if this other thing will work, that sounds like it would be ideal for the spay neuter clinic and uh, would probably be uh, ideal for the other two because it's they get on the bypass and they can be there about as quick as they can be the other play. Okay, Supervisor Biggs. Well, I just wanted to thank you for taking your time and doing this. You know, I, I think that was important for us to to have the information and. Uh, some of the things that you found were some of the concerns that were brought up the night that this came up. And I still maintain um, that, I agree that it needs to be between the population points and it needs to be an easy access for volunteers. Um, so I, I'm sort of looking at it as I was, I was in favor of, of where it was gonna be in the first place, but after Mr. Creed brought this up, I thought it was important to investigate. And I think you did a, a good job sort of pulling all that together because I, you know, I've been in that school and it's the same school that I actually teach in. It's the same model, early 70s. And so I sort of know the. I mean, massive square footage, it's, yeah. you know, it's. Um, the ventilation is very poor. It's the it was designed to be an efficient school where energy efficient, where you didn't have any windows that opened or anything, everything went through the top of the roof and, and sometimes that doesn't work. So you would have to really make an effort to replace everything there. Well you'd also have to do that to put in a new one. So you know six one half dozen the other both needs that done. So that's a square. Uh, well a lot of these animals are coming from the Blacksburg and Christiansburg area. That's where a lot of these animals are coming from. So and especially the cat problem. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, neighbor. Thank you. I don't see you very often. I know. But <laughs> I apologize for the length of the grass. Sometimes it's just you know. Sometimes it's this stuff yeah. that takes precedence. You haven't seen my backyard. So I don't even worry about that. But 
I do know that you spend a great deal of time uh, working with our animals, and, and I do appreciate it. Um, Thank you. Uh, we used to, across the street from where we live, we used to have Doris Huffman, who was with the Humane Society, oh, yes. and yep. that's how we got most of our dogs. So um, I really appreciate what you all do, and um, I hope that we can help in any way that's possible sure. to, to get this thing going and do what ought to be done for our animals. So I'm thank here. you. I'm here to do whatever you guys need me to do. You just ask, and I'm, I'm happy to step up and thank do the you. best I can. Thank you. Any, anybody else? Well, thank you, Kelly and Jason and Carol, for bringing us up to date and then the presentation. Motion to go out of work session. So moved. Second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Mr. Cree? Aye. Ms. Rogers? Aye. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Six aye. We we'll move on to public address. Uh, we have uh, two citizens that signed up to speak, and uh, would you please come to the speaker's podium and clearly state your name and address using the podium mic. Uh, Mr. Bill Mary. And I've got to tell you, you have five minutes to. Bill Murray, 401 Gibbons Lane, Blacksburg. Good evening. I have, I'm concerned, I have some, some concerns and questions about the one-time allocation of money for school projects. <laughs> and my concerns are, first, that these are not one-time allocations, that they're reoccurring. And with that being said, second concern is that it does not appear the reoccurring request that the needs of the teachers and the students are being not being met. For example, uh, three examples. First, with building repairs. Some time ago, the board uh, appropriated $1.1 million for building repairs. Of that, about 600000 was spent. So now they're requesting 150000 which when you run the numbers on the balance sheet, they have the second one is technology. There was a substantial allocation for technology a while ago. It was not used. So they still have money for technology. They're requesting 250000 I believe, currently. And the third one is the strangest of all, the buses. There was $1.6 million allocated for new buses as a supplemental fund funding. Then there was a line item for 800000 for new buses. Now there's a request for 350000 for new buses. That's $2.75 million, almost $3 million. And there's no buses that have been purchased yet. So that's, those are my concerns. And those are three examples that lead to those concerns. My questions are, why are we even calling this a one-time allocation when it's reoccurring? And where's the money going? There doesn't seem to be any accountability for the money not spent, or even the money spent. When I was contracting with the federal government and running a lab, I had a budget, and when I spent money, I would have the PI come down often and say, let me see what you bought. And I'd show them and say, turn it on. How does it work? Have you, have you checked it out? Is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? Did we spend our money properly? I don't see that happening with school projects and, and it really is, bothers me a lot since we've already raised taxes to fund the debt that we're incurring from to build more more buildings for the schools and we have surplus buildings sitting unused and my last question is what guarantee do we have that the students and the teachers are going to get what they need out of the school budget and so that doesn't come back and ask for more money. I mean, there, there's planning issues, there's justification issues, it's, and, and it's not that the taxpayers is throwing money out and, and not having to go to anything. The students are uh, suffering, and the teachers are trying to work with promises, and they're not getting any delivery on the promises. So those are my concerns and questions. I hope you'll find some answers before you appropriate any more money for school projects. And, 
and just have some accountability and a little more transparency in where the money's going. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Todd King. Italy. Italy. Okay. Now that we're down to that point, if it's anyone else that who has not signed up to speak at the public address session, they can do so at this time. Seeing no one, we're closing the public address session. Uh, item 10, uh, addendum. We don't have any addendum. No, sir, we do not. So we can move to the consent agenda. Do I hear a motion? Second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Please call the roll. Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Mr. Creed? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Mr. Tuff? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Six hours. Okay. New business. Subject A. Supplemental appropriation of one-time funding county projects. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll be glad to discuss that. Okay. This is, if you recall back in the fiscal year 13 budget process, uh, we had recommended that uh, several miscellaneous projects for the county be funded from uh, some of the one-time money that was made available with the uh, June collections of the, of the increased tax rate. Uh, those projects totaled $398,610. Uh, and a listing of those projects is included in the resolution and staff will be glad to answer any questions or address any concerns. Any questions, comments, concerns? Yeah, I, I've got a couple. In regards, we, we've got the motor mile compliance within the $150,000 and we do have before the Planning Commission they're working on trying to come up with a non-pervious uh, allocating these funds. Uh, is it premature to set that that motor mile compliance at this point in time for the hundred and fifty thousand dollars? I believe you want to take that one. Yeah. You were chewing on your glasses. I figured you had it quicker than I did. <laughs> Just getting ready <laughs> in case I have to see something. Um, if you'll notice in the resolution, there's a separate of that related to parks and recreation and that's because the the idea was to place that in the capital fund not in the operating budget so that if there was a change in what happened with motor mile and that was no longer needed it would remain in the capital account for other capital projects with parks and recreation and those would do, be determined at a different time and then the funds would be moved to a particular parks and recreation project. That was the idea behind that in the event that the requirement changed and those funds weren't necessary for Motor Mile Park alone. And before you leave, uh, <laughs> classification, um, it, and maybe this isn't done, um, but is there a way that we could look at using utilizing our own employees but offering them bonuses uh, because this would be an additional job service that they would be doing uh, doing a classification study but doing it in-house maybe doing it for five or ten thousand dollars giving out bonuses rather than spend thirty five thousand is that done in other counties and as far as looking at classifications it has been my experience which is about 34 years of it now Shudder to think. You started young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, you don't typically do classification studies in house, and it's because of the nature of the study. I mean, any way you go, you're generally going to be perceived as being biased. Um, you're most of the time you're looking for a, a set of skills that's out there and doing it, but you're also looking for somebody independent who is not on a daily basis involved with it. Your internal staff then generally takes the tools that are provided and they manage that front forward, but it is not typically an in-house overall study done for compensation and classification. They, it's usually done for particular groups within the management of an overall plan. I, I guess, and, and this was done 
before my time, and you would have been here, but my understanding was there was recent, when I say recently, within the last 10 years, a classification study, but those funding levels, are, those levels were never funded because, and, and so I, I guess we can't utilize those old classification studies because they're out of date and that we would need to bring them up to date, but if I don't know that we're going to be generating any additional income to be able to fund this new classification study. I guess that's my concern, that we'll just spend this $35,000 and not have the monies to be able to fund it. Well, okay. <laughs> Maybe the that's question a was. Sorry, that's um, a bad lawyer question. About three I, I do sort of feel that way. Yes, I'm like, should I take the oath or something? <laughs> but um, in general, with uh, I, I think particularly in this instance, I think what you're attempting to do is to not completely do an overall reclassification. And and I'm looking to Craig because he's got some ideas on this as well. But what you're looking to do is to determine where your major problems are within a classification Expect level that. and attempt to address those. Because I really don't think that you can pay for an overall compensation and classification study for $35,000. No, I was just going to no, add that a complete pay comprehensive comp I can't say compensation. Thank you. I was saying compre a comprehensive compensation study uh, would probably run for this organization probably between 100 and 150 thousand. And what we asked for in the budget was 35 thousand in order to target several areas within the county that we have particular concerns that we have fallen behind. And you're exactly right. Uh, we can do a study. Um, you know, the results of that study will certainly be brought back to the board for discussion, but, you know, budgets being what they are, it may be that we still can't provide the funding, but we at least need to be, in my opinion, you know, it, there's a lot of rumors at times, there's a lot of discussion that goes on about, well, this area is behind, that area is behind. In order to continue to retain and recruit the best possible employees, we need to understand where our weak spots are and try to address them if we can. And kind of Matt. follow up to that question, um, perhaps for Craig. Um, are these specific areas being targeted because of staff loss? Yes. In those? Okay. Yes. That's what I thought. Because of, because of challenges in retaining employees. And, uh, Go ahead, Mr. Craig. I was just wondering what good, uh, you know, if you're talking about, sound like you were talking about money on one hand and something else on the other. I'm not sure exactly where you, where you were at, but, uh, and that's part because I wasn't paying great attention. Uh, <laughs> and part of that, if you were talking about the uh, ball field and, and $150,000 of that, well, if you're spending $150,000 on a study, Then you don't have either one. You don't have the hundred fifty thousand dollars or the well, lot at the ball field. Well, I think the, the, the thought and the reason for, for recommended the 35000 is uh, as we crafted the budget for fiscal year 13, I knew that recommending a complete compensation and pay class study for the entire organization would probably not make it through the budget. I just knew that Number one, as I said, it would be between $100,000 and $150,000 to do such a study. And secondly, if you do a study comprehensively of the entire organization, I would shudder to think at what the numbers are going to come back looking like that we need to address. So the thought and discussion with, with the management team was let's identify the areas where we're ha we know we're having specific problems right now and try to, as if you will, bite off a couple of little pieces and address those. That's the reason we only ask for the 35000 And uh, Supervisor Tuck, to, to kind of reiterate what Carol said as well, I've seen in my 20 plus years of local government experience, I've seen one or two studies done internally. Usually when a study's done internally, at some point it collapses because of exactly what Carol says. There's, there's alleged bias either by 
the governing body who has concerns about how the information was pulled together or and it was the case in another example I'm familiar with, it collapsed internally because there was so much bickering among department heads about why didn't you look at this? Well, how come you didn't do that? And so they finally just threw the whole thing out and went outside and did a study. It's been my, it's been my, uh, what, what few of these things I've seen is that it was that way anyhow, whether it was in the house or whether somebody else got it. Nobody seen. Uh, well, they're always subject to spirited debate. <laughs> <laughs> too, too much in favor of. It. I'm going to add a comment, and uh, and and a lot of times this holds true with in-house studies, is that you can assemble a group of your your best people to guide and direct this thing, but uh, there's always like a, a 80 to 85 percent that they don't look at the position. They, being in-house, they look at the person in the position and they class do it that way. I mean, they're sitting there, so, well, Thomas, he's over here in this position, he's classed by here. He don't really do, do that much. And they, they need to look at the position, not the person in the position. And also, it needs to be done by uh, individuals with experience doing this. These people, have uh, access to so much other information. They would look at, you know, counties our size, uh, whether it's in Northern Virginia, New York, or somewhere. You can't take Montgomery County and compare them with Fairfax because we'd really be behind good part of two salaries. So they'd have to, they have all of the expertise in doing a comprehensive study. Yes, you may, they may say uh, A, B, C, and D. But we as a board and the county administrator would know exactly where his employees are as far as salary <laughs> and stuff like this. You may not have no money to address it, but at least you know, well, this position has fell behind by a couple thousand dollars. This one is okay and so forth. You might not have the money to address it, but at least you know exactly where you are. Instead of, uh, I can't think when the last study was done, 2005. Uh, 2005. I would say that that one's fell way behind, and you need to sort of keep current of what you're looking at, whether you got the money to address it or not. You know, it says, oh, this is where we are. Well, yeah, and and I will agree to that somewhat, but if you've got a study. And it shows that everybody, for instance, is behind, and you don't have no money to get there. What difference does it make what the study says? Because the I mean, experts have told us that we're behind. If we sit and use our imagination and look, and we don't know that we're behind, but when the experts tell us we're behind. So that's something else that we think about as a board in the compensation package. We may not be able to address it, but we know that's an item on the table that we should think about. And the other thing is that, you know, we may have fallen behind a sum on our payroll, but you can bet your boots that everybody else in the state did too. Bill, let me ask you this, and, and I'm sorry, did Mary had her hands up. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Supervisor Biggs. Well, I was just going to ask, um, do you bid this out or do you go back to the same company you used before to follow up since they're familiar with what they did? or? Are, and, and do you think it's going to cost the whole 35000 to address these key points, or do you think it could cost less? It or? could, well, I'll start with the easy one. It could, well, it could cost less depending on how many departments we initially identify for the study. 35000 is the max. And as far as bidding it out, it is a professional service, so we don't have to go through a formal bid process. It's negotiations. Um, I will say this, um, the group that did the study in 2005, uh, in the three years I've been here, I, I have some concerns about that study. Um, I don't even know if that group's still in, in business. They may be, but my, my strong feeling would be to take a look at who over the last couple of years have done what I call credible studies, those that, you know, because I agree with Supervisor Creed, you can go out and do a study, and then if you're so far off the mark, I mean, it's not, that, that really doesn't do you much good. So 
we would look for firms that have done credible studies in other jurisdictions, talk with them, give them the opportunity to compete, and then bring them in on a limited so maybe basis. So ones that have, been, have stayed in business over time. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Sure. And I guess you know where the hot spots are, and maybe we, if you can help explain it to me. Then it, I assume that's areas where we got high turnover, and I know just because I'm limited from my experience that a lot of times it's law enforcement. I know we're competing against Christiansburg, we're competing against Blacksburg, we're competing against Virginia Tech to keep deputies, and I know it costs us a lot of money to train. Well, if that's we have turnover. Then I can say, okay, we need to do something about. We need to be competitive with our opening salaries and ongoing salaries, so we can. But. I, I, I have trouble understanding why we have to go outside, why we can't just look at what our, our competition and say, okay, you know, and that's my competition. She's paying $40,000 for a start salary for uh, a sergeant, and, and that's what we need to meet and, and look at that without going outside. And, and maybe, and again, I know I'm new to this process, but I don't understand why we can't look at where we have high turnover rates, make that adjustment, and then use part of this $35,000 to help th that issue. I understand what you're saying. How do these particular areas fit in the overall classification plan? Because you have to ensure, or what's important is to review the whole classification and then how do those fit within it? And so it's a bigger piece than just a market comparison of salaries. It's included in d duties and how those fit within the overall plan. And trying to maintain internal equity. That's always that's what I get rid of that. yeah. internal equity. That's, yeah, that's, that's the big challenge in, in an organization that's got, well, it was a challenge even in Bedford with 125 employees, but it's a real challenge when you've got, you know, a, a sheriff's department that's got as many personnel as they do. Is You can look at your competition and look at how you're paying things, but then all of a sudden you start having some real pay compression issues with folks that have been here two years versus folks that have been here 10 years. And it, it the short answer to a question is, yes, we have staff that is capable, that are capable of doing that. The problem is it takes a tremendous amount of time. And you'd basically have to pull somebody off for weeks to get that done, whereas folks that do this for a living can come in and just usually knock them out a lot quicker, but but it is more expensive. Yeah, I think we had a what a motion in a second. No, but I'll make and a motion. Discussion. Uh, do we have a motion before? No. Oh, no. Okay. No. Yeah. Just okay. Discussing. Okay. Members made the motion. Do I, do I hear a second? Second. Uh, any further discussion? <laughs> I, I would just like to say, in regards to, my, I, I have a feeling I'm going to vote no against it. It's going to be because of the that plan. Everything else, I, I was going to make a motion that was going to cover everything, but and uh, but uh, I wanted to explain my vote uh, a little bit, and that's where I'm at. Sure. Okay. Can the clerk please call the roll. Mr. Cree. No. Ms. Perkins. Aye. Ms. Biggs. Aye. Mr. Tuck. Nay. Mr. Gabriel. Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Four eyes, two nine. Okay, moving right along. Subject B, supplemental appropriation of one-time monies for school projects. I guess, again, that's... I can, I can cover that. You do okay. have a tab in your, uh, in your agenda packet, tab E, uh, and I believe this has been distributed to you a couple of times. This was a letter that was sent from Chair Jones of the school board to Chair Politis back in June uh, requesting uh, the $750,000 uh, of one-time money, uh, $250,000 for building repair, $150,000 for technology improvements and replacement of four buses for $350,000. Uh, also, um, as we discussed, uh, when we were putting the fiscal year 13 budget together, um, these are items that they had requested as part of the budgeting process, and I had pulled those out and recommended that you consider those for one-time funding as well. So that's confirmation of that. Any I, questions? Early on, and y'all have seen the emails that I've sent some of you, I had some serious questions about this. And uh, I have talked to several school board members, 
I have been at meetings where that was discussed that they said this money absolutely will be spent on these items. Um, there has to be a level of trust at some point in time. Now, I got to admit that I was very reluctant. Um, I think I showed that in some of the emails I sent everybody. Um, but I, I want to work together with the school board. I believe that they will spend this money, or if they don't spend this money, they will come back before the board and they will say, listen, we need to spend it someplace else. Um, if I'm wrong, I'll be burned, and I understand that, and I understand why you might be angry about it. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and trust some of the school board members I've talked with, and, uh, and I'm going to vote in favor of this. Okay. Uh, Supervisor. Makes yeah, I think um, that was the reason we requested that the letter come from the school board and that they, they officially send it. I think we had a discussion one evening and we and sent that back through our liaison committee to make sure that this, this would be cleared up for this year since there had been the problem the year before with a misunderstanding. So um, I think that this really clarifies it and um, I'm going to support it. Supervisor Gabe. Yeah, just supporting something that Supervisor Tuck had mentioned that every, as a school board, uh, the representative to the school board, um, every meeting that I've been to for the past several months, they have, Chairman Jones has said, our, when we send this letter, I want the board's approval, the board's consent, that the, it, the money will indeed be used for what we're asking for, and he's gotten unanimous, he's gotten consensus every time he's asked for that. So mm -hmm. that's, that's all I have to say. Mr. Greg? Yeah, I, I want to know where all the money's coming from. You know, I thought we, in our budget we kind of had that thing down to where we didn't have a whole lot more money, and if we keep putting it out at seven hundred fifty thousand dollars at a white, we're gonna really have no money. Uh, this is part of the part of, of the part of the one-time money that was approximately four point two. Is that right? It's about 4.2 million that we brought in as one-time money with the June collections, uh, recommending the 398.610 come from that, the 750 come from that, and then your next resolution um, also recommends 65,000. The rest will simply go into reserves to be determined by this board at a future date as to how you want to allocate that. How much is the rest? For let me do some rough math. About three point, about three point one, around three point one million. And, and just just for the record, there was no misunderstandings. Everything was understood exactly the way it was said, and I have that on tape if you'd like to see it. <coughs> Any other comments? I think I agree with uh, Mr. Tuck that uh, the school board intends to spend this money this way and um, again I think we made it very clear uh, when the information uh, was first brought to our attention and I am um, I'm willing to um, support their their efforts and I'll, I'll agree we need to um, this is we're going to have to work together and if it's any kind of uh, walls between us we need this will help start uh, those walls coming down and when we come together for our joint meetings and things like this uh, we have to start somewhere uh, improving uh, I guess the communication between the two and, and the trust and so forth so I uh, go along with supervisor talk like yeah. one, yeah. one other question yeah. on this thing you got a uh, tire change for sixteen hundred and fifty dollars per bus and it's in the tab most of these change or a lot of these changes have never been on the road that are on the, these old buses because uh, they don't go when it's much snow or ice around, uh, and we haven't had a whole lot. So it just seems to me that you know you just go ahead and outfit one with everything, and you take the other and just throw it away. And a chain, you know, don't.
go away. It doesn't get bad. It's it's there, and uh, unless it's been used, you, that's sixteen hundred and fifty dollars per bus. Gary, yeah. I think the, this system, as I understand it, you basically push a button and those things that's go right. on. Mm -hmm. It's different. It's not the ch the old chains that you get up kids, physically and put on. The school buses were putting the chains on when they were out there with the tire arms yeah. and they were tightening them down. It is a very detail, and it's not like they can just take. I understand a second. that. The only thing I'm saying is, is that we haven't had the weather to wire out the chains. We we wouldn't have worn out a set of chains in the last ten years if it was on the same bus all the time. Uh, much less uh, ones that are less than that. So I don't. It's probably some some special chains that work right. with this system and so forth so you just can't take any kind of chain and, and put in there if you can push a button and it puts itself on. Bill, yeah. um, that last sentence says for the most recent purchase the vehicle cost was $83,370, the radio was 500 the camera system was 1900 and the tire chain 1650 for total cost those are the new purchases. If you look at the school buses as they go along, you will see those chains hanging down underneath the bus. Right. And yes, they are automatically put on um, the tires for the safety of the children. So they're really talking about equipping, or maybe I'm not reading it correctly, but it's well, equipping the new buses that's right. for um, use uh, in the future so it's not the uh, because it, they say they estimated costs for a new school bus is 87.5 and then they break it down so what to me that's what they're saying that's what the new buses include yeah that's what a new bus would include and um, and I do want to say there's one thing I forgot uh, when I was just talking a moment ago, I, this is not, I hope, our attempt to micromanage what the school system does. What we simply did was to ask for some responsibility and accounting for a specific one-time deal. I think that's how I look at it, and I think again, it's um, as as has already been stated. It's it's. Uh, an attempt to to work together to get what we need. Other comments, questions? Are we what? ready to move on? What, Chris? I, I was. I made a comment uh, that, uh, and it, this might be slightly inappropriate, but it might play to Mr. Creed a little bit. That uh, trust but verify is what I'm looking at, and I'm sure that both that all of us will be looking to see how this is spent. But at some point in time, we need to, to see if we can trust each other a little bit. And, and I am not in your shoes. I was not on the board when all this, uh, some of the other actions took place. Um, and, but I, as I said, I feel compelled to call some of the school board members to talk with them. Um, and if, if I've been in your shoes, I might be saying some of the exact same things that you've said. No, you'd probably be saying worse. Uh, <laughs> you'd, you'd probably have been saying somebody needs to get fired, and that's really what needed to be done. So, well, I'd like to go ahead and put the motion on the floor to vote on. Second. Uh, have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Miss Perkins. Aye. Miss Biggs. Aye. Mr. Tuck. Aye. Mr. Gabriel. Aye. Mr. Creed. No. Mr. Brown? Aye. Five ayes, one no. Item C, Board of Supervisors joined us that a supplemental mm -hmm. appropriation of one-time funding for Board of Supervisors joined us study. Mr. Chair, this is additional money um, that is needed to complete all the work that has been done on the joinder study. Uh, as you're aware, 
that nice big two inch book I gave you a couple of weeks ago. Um, Draper Aiden has spent considerable time uh, in pulling together a lot of engineering information. Also, there was quite a bit of time spent in meetings. Uh, the negotiation process has been um, quite extensive and involved a number of meetings. Um, but I believe in talking with uh, Jerry Higgins at the Water Authority and with uh, Rick DeSalvo at Draper Aiden, this is our best estimate of the final remaining cost to get that part of the study done. At, at one point in time, there were some questions that they were saying they didn't want to see us use any taxpayer money. Uh, to, for the, are they okay? The other entities okay with us using this money? Yes. Okay. That's, yeah. That the, was my only there's, there's never been an issue with. Uh, they've been pleased that the county has picked up the tab for studying whether we need to join their group or not. But. Okay. Do y'all have that on your screen? I, I can't seem to find it. Did you go to C, subject C? Can be. Subject what? Subject C on the agenda report. C? Uh huh, subject C under. St. Clair Lane map for PDF is what my that is, That's Are under. You on the agenda report? That's consent agenda, I think. Yeah, go to agenda report, subject C, new business. It should be on there. I had some trouble picking up some of those earlier yeah. today. It was right after item B that we were discussing earlier. It, it's not got its own tab. Yeah, it's no, just it like doesn't on the agenda tab. report. Yeah, yeah, it's just under agenda report under no. item A on the on your index on the left side. Well, the the letter is under C. E. Yes, ma'am. I've got an agenda report. Right. All right, if you click on the left, but I don't see anything that tells me that's closed meeting. <laughs> click a, click on agenda report and yeah. scroll down to page five of six. You have to, and you have to go all the way to the bottom. Could of it have part B and left? A's, B's, and C's, and not five? It's big stock five. Very top. Someone just go out there. Go down. There's agenda July the 9th. Let's try that on the PDF. Yeah. The agenda report. Okay, this is what you need right here. Let's do That's this. where I was just at. Okay, now go right here. Right here and go. But right here. Okay. See? It's yeah. in it's all right in that other stuff. Right. It's the letter is thing is right here because there's no tab that goes with it. So if you yeah, if you start down this way. The tab is under E. The letter yeah, is. But I did have some trouble earlier today seeing the tabs. Unfortunately. Yeah, we, were, we were talking about that. Yeah. Huh? They just wouldn't come up. But they're up now, which is, I guess I'm in this building or something. I don't something know. Something with the internet at your house, probably. They stopped at tab five with Planning Commission and I couldn't get anything beyond that. Are we all, can I move approval of the, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Second. Have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Any discussion? Yeah, I'd just like okay. to, this is only for the joinder study, is that correct? Yeah. It's not us saying yay or nay or Okay. Oh, sir. Oh, just to, about just the so we can finish paying not the bills. Talking about yeah. The yeah. Schools. Yeah. I'm sorry. There is nothing to go with them other than the okay. uh, agenda report. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Ms. Biggs? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Mr. Creed? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Six ayes. Well, that moves us on down to, uh, Carl, are you standing in for Marty to give the county attorney's report? No report. Okay. <laughs> I think we Good. Should, I think you you report it just the way he told you. I know. Okay. <laughs> we'll move on uh, to the county administrator's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I did get an email from the county attorney today to let you know that he would sincerely miss being here tonight. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, it's okay. Just a couple items I wanted to mention under my report tonight. I do want to thank uh, all the fire and rescue volunteers and sheriff's deputies and really anyone that uh, has been working hard over the last 
10 days to get um, the county put back together after the storms we had a week ago Friday night and then um, one thing that wasn't reported a whole lot but in many parts of the county we had as much damage from the Sunday night storm than we did the Friday night storm so we had a lot of uh, damage uh, we're going to have a meeting later this week as a kind of a post assessment follow-up to talk about what went well what didn't go well um, and uh, things that we need to learn to do differently but if you guys hear any issues or concerns um, in particular uh, please let us know so we can follow up on them I know that uh, the Solid Waste Authority I believe Supervisor Creed's <coughs> meeting later in the week to talk about the brush issue a little bit um, that seems to be the biggest challenge we've had in the county is what to do with all the brush. Would that answer the, the citizen that wrote in about that? Yes, okay. it will. It will. Yeah. Um, I know that. Yeah, that we're going to discuss it a little bit further yeah. once yeah. we get get around yeah. to it. And, um, but that'll be discussed. But thanks to all the folks that have worked on that. Uh, I will be touching base with, with each of you uh, later in the week to talk about a time to get together for a tour of the courthouse. Um, you know, we talked about that about six weeks ago, and then after I had an opportunity to go through the courthouse, there were just, it, it was sort of like a puzzle that was not quite put together yet. And I wanted to wait till we were a little closer so that you could get a much better picture of, of how that building's going to work out. Uh, I will say the contractor has done a tremendous job over the last month getting us closer to completion. Um, the official move-in date is going to be late September or early October, and that is not, that is not the exclusive fault of the contractor at this point. Uh, we have to get the IT systems up and running, and we depend on the Supreme Court of Virginia to provide the IT systems for the court services. Um, if we had hit the target earlier in the spring, they would have been able to get it up, but at this point, because of some of the delays, it's going to be late September or early October before they can get everything up and running. That's not necessarily a bad thing. We're very hopeful that we're going to get the building turned over to the county within the next 30 days or so and that will actually give us some time to if you will get the building up and running get the furniture in place get the systems in place so that when we do move at the end of September we will be ready to go so that's um, that's going to be a good thing we're looking forward to that but I will be touching base with you to talk about times to, to come over and walk through the courthouse with us uh, last thing is I will um, be sending an email later this week as well about our extended work session on uh, July 30th um, it, 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 as mentioned a couple of folks have been missing a couple of times but we did talk about the 16th and the 30th doing two half days but i wanted to make sure if it was any way possible to have all the board members be able to attend the 30th was the only day that that appeared to work so i've asked everybody to hold that open that will probably be pretty much an all-day session and then what we'll do is as we have follow-ups i'm sure there'll be quite a number of follow-ups that come out of that work session on the 30th we'll schedule additional time in the weeks ahead to, to do that but um, I've already got quite an agenda for that day and I'm, I'm working hard to figure out how to get it all in what's about, the hours I'd like to start about 8 30 or 9 if we could uh, about 9 Gary we old we didn't want to get up early about, about 9 breakfast. 8 30 or 9 <laughs> supervisor <laughs> Tuck has already contracted for, <laughs> for breakfast uh, we'll find lunch and we'll stay you know We'll stay as late as y'all want to stay that day. We're going to have breakfast. You're doing breakfast. Chris is doing breakfast. I, I, my, my chickens are laying eggs, plenty of them. We're going. I'm gonna cook up. I, I like real men do eat quiche, spinach, with country ham, and all sorts, sorts of good things. So, mm -hmm. Location is still to be determined. Uh, Your living room. We, no, we, will, we, will, we will probably do it in a it's county Chris facility Henry. somewhere, uh, but I'll keep you posted. Where we're going to eat breakfast wherever we have it. Wherever we have it. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah we'll, we'll have an eating meeting. Mm -hmm. We're not going to have breakfast. I don't want to come early. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They will bribe, bribe you with yes, food to get right. you there. Uh, Supervisor Biggs. Okay, well. I attended the New River Valley Community Services meeting on June 27th, and I'm, um, some of you might have heard, or if you haven't heard, um, the executive director, Harvey Barker, is going to retire. Um, 
at the end of October, October 31st, 2012. Um, he uh, is, is, is a loss. It's a big loss to our community. He's done an outstanding job. He's, he's worked there over 33 years. Um, but he just felt like it was time for him to experience some other things and do some other things. And so they'll be working really hard to find a replacement and, um, and he will continue in his position and, and continue to work on the strategic planning until he actually leaves at the end of October. So I thought you would want to know that. And uh, um, it's just sad because he's just been such a good director. So that was all I have from that meeting. And I guess that's it. Supervisor Perkins. OK, we have. Um, at the Planning District Commission, we are going through a strategic um, plan and also an evaluation of how the Planning District Commission is organized and how uh, it functions as a group. We will be meeting with um, a consultant um, in August. So um, that I'm looking forward to because Kevin has done an outstanding job as uh, the executive director, and he really wants this done because I think he has another vision for where he would like to see the Planning District Commission uh, go, and uh, he has certainly um, worked with the executive committee to get that done. Mike Patton from Floyd County um, is uh, the new chair and Kevin Sullivan, who works for Virginia Tech as an attorney. He is the vice chair. And then, of course, um, we have uh, Mr. Weaver, who is the treasurer. And the secretary is uh, one of the <coughs> people that's a staff person type thing. But at any rate, um, that, that group is moving along. And I bring it up because Mr. Politis had a slide presentation uh, to talk to uh, the Planning District Commission about his hemp project. And the Planning District Commission discussed it. And uh, it was um, accepted by the, the resolution was accepted by the, the Planning District Commission. So um, he was very pleased with that by the time he left. And then um, I've attended some some of our other meetings um, coming up, of course, will be the social services area. And um, also, I was, um, uh, as I said before, at the last Economic Development Commission meeting, too. I also I have some material at home that I meant to bring tonight, and I had it together, and somehow it didn't get there. Um, but there is an interesting presentation by Roger Hedgepath as to the Blacksburg Public-Private Partnership activities. Uh, and I wanted you all to see those and have a copy of them, so no, I'll try I, to get them to you. Okay, and I'll put them in the Friday report. Okay, be glad to. I was just going to say it. Because I, I just think it's an interesting area which uh, we don't know a, a lot about. And uh, so we'll there, there were a couple of things that came out of that meeting that were, I thought, you were, were you there? You oh, were there, uh, weren't you? You were there longer than I was. Well, and I was going to, that's what I was going to say. I will I picked up, I'm pretty sure I brought back all that information as well. So even if you don't get a chance to find it, I'll make sure we include it in the report. Okay, okay. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Supervisor Creed. I really, I guess I'll say something. Yeah, I, I was going to say no report. But I think, uh, and I'm going to get back to the animal shelters because, uh, you know, it might have come down to look like I am not for animal shelters. And that's not in any case, shape, or form true. However, I do not believe this report that we got tonight was in any way even close to what it's going to take to put a shelter 
back in the spot where shelter is coming from because it's going to take probably at least a year to build it. Maybe more than that, but at least a year. Probably more like a year and a half to two years to, to for the demolition and, and uh, removal of the stuff and then to get everything going back. During that time, you've got to have a place to put your animals. Uh, just a lot of things that weren't there when, if we're supposed to be looking at uh, the place, the best place to put uh, an animal shelter. Uh, ideally, you would want to put it someplace that it's not unless you, the place that it's not is big enough to move your shelter to where you could put it there and still run the other one. Uh, that would be the ideal thing if, if you could, you know, if you was going to put it uh, where the old one's at, if you could put another one, put a new one beside it somewhere, some way, but that, from what I can tell from these renderings here, is not something that can happen. Not that it shouldn't or couldn't or wouldn't, but it, it, I don't believe that it can uh, happen to where you can keep your animals there and still go ahead and build you a, a shelter. So, yeah, it just seemed like, to me like there was a point that was wanting to be made and beside that one point, none of the rest of it had any matter to it. And that's all I have to say. Okay, Supervisor Gabriel. Uh, just one thing I, I, I had sent around an email. I'd gotten an email from a constituent um, who had suggested that we might be able to um, we might consider uh, waiving the fee for collecting brush at the, the landfill sites. And um, But I guess um, to understand that, that that will be discussed at the Solid Waste Authority. The, the Solid Come Waste on. Authority controls the, the landfill and okay. they've got to make a decision. And I, uh, y'all are meeting Thursday, is that yeah. right? Uh, it, we discussed it in here earlier today and I think there's going to be some, at least I've been told there's going to be some consideration for that, but that's up to the, the Solid Waste Board. Okay. okay, and I know that, I mean, uh, it's my, I know in Blacksburg, I, I'm, I think in Christiansburg as well, I mean, the towns are actually collecting and they're, they're having a service. They're just they're basically circling the neighborhoods over and over and over again until they stop finding big piles, so. Yeah, they've, you know. they've actually been told to put the brush along the side of the road. Yeah, you're right. Mm. Yeah. Just as they do leaves. Yeah. And they come by and they've got these big chippers and they just cut it up as they go. Shredding it up. And yeah. uh, so they are. The towns are taking care of theirs. Uh, what discussion I guess we would have to have is what we're going to do about the camp. Yeah. I think one of the things, and I know we don't have the the uh, uh, tools and everything to do what the towns are doing because, uh, a matter of fact, uh, the street I live on, VDOT was in there with about $500,000 worth of equipment to clean up three or four pine trees and, and, and all day long. So I was talking with them a little bit and I asked them where it was going. They have a spot up on Cinnabar where they dump it too. Uh, the thing about it is that if you live within the county and you don't have a place to haul it to, I mean, just like if you got plenty of property, yeah, you can pile it up and burn it and do stuff like this, but and uh, if you look at some of these areas, they still look like disaster areas. You know, there's uh, people with large trees and pile of brushes that fell across pile lines and so forth on the property. And I'm sure that if you were in, in that business of cleaning up, up that stuff, you could make some money. But uh, usually all of these uh, contractors now are working for AEP, like uh, it's a uh, ass plung or whatever it is. I mean, they must have brought some trucks in from somewhere else because I've seen, you know, hundreds of them. So the thing about it is trying not to penalize our citizens because they have trees and brush in the yard. They can't take them to the recycling centers and what do we do with them? And so if it was even a reduced rate or, or something that they could get the trucks and, and haul it in there because yeah. And I and I, uh, if I can interject one thing too, we did have a discussion early last week about 
should we try to take it at the convenient sites but the problem no, no. There, there was a huge problem with that is we would have to use roll-offs to collect it and transport it and that was going to get astronomically expensive and we said that's not that's not enough no no you don't have enough no we would have to rent roll-offs no, to do no. it and we just uh, don't think do staff it. could even keep up no with we could tell you what i've seen a lot of folks do down my way people that normally uh mow grass in the summertime are out getting up these things for people. I mean, they paint them, but they're out getting them up. And that might be uh, somewhat of a solution uh, if, if they can get out and get them to, to, to get them up and take them wherever they're taking them to. They, they get them, uh, I've seen some trees, some, some humongous trees. That, right. uh, I know one in particular, right as I come out of my driveway up this little piece, uh, took them two days. You get one tree. I mean, it was a big old cedar tree, but they, they finally got all the limbs off of it and then cut the other up. Uh, you know, them old pines are not the best thing in the world unless you got them real dry to burn in your chimney because they'll stop them up. Mm -hmm. So, wouldn't recommend a whole lot of that, but if you can dry them real good, you know, you, you can burn them somewhat. Uh, but other than that, we'll just have to see what we can come up, up with us, you know, to help that out. I, I don't know how you do, my thinking, I don't know how you do one without including everybody, no matter who dumped it there. Uh, and that may be something that uh, we can address over there, but uh, we'll, we'll certainly try and see if there's something we can do with it. I know they're, they're uh, chopping it up and selling it back to you for mulch. <laughs> they're they're going to they have an abundant supply. <laughs> yeah. Well, what they'll do is anything that they can't use, they I ship on the up to Pulaski. But I, I, as long as it's just going to be discussed and some whatever the decision is made that we just just have to well, deal with. Mm -hmm. Is, is I that just it? do hope that we can do something. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Is, yeah. is that it, That's all. Mr. Tuck? Uh, a couple of things. We do have the vacancies on the, the planning commission. We've got two for the at-large, um, but we'll be advertising for the planning commission for District E. Um, we're looking forward to getting good applicants for that as well. Uh, on a couple of different notes, uh, one, I'd ask this board to consider, and I'm not saying asking to do it tonight, but one of the things I would like to do is go before the town of Christiansburg and ask them, uh, along with the town of Blacksburg, about going for Virginia Tech and trying to get them to charge the mills tax so that there is a level playing field because uh, I believe that as they continue to put more and more restaurants on Virginia Tech's campus, it is affecting the tax base that allows us to have teachers, allows us to pay for schools, sheriff's department, and the like. And by having all these restaurants now on Virginia Tech's campus that are not, it is affecting the, the, the businesses that do pay taxes in this county. I understand that there, this has been a long and ongoing battle, but just as we're seeing that the Joinder study is moving forward, perhaps that we can start and, uh, and, and try to see if we can talk Virginia Tech into a charge in a meals tax uh, and, and collecting it so that businesses can be on level uh, level playing field. I'm willing to go before the town of Christiansburg. I'm willing to, to go uh, before the town of Blacksburg. I imagine the town of Blacksburg will be thrilled. Um, but I, I think we need to come before them as a unified front. Um, but that, that's, that's my report. Couldn't that go through the... Um you know, the, the liaison, the liaison, liaison, liaison. That meets for breakfast. Yeah, yeah we can talk about it. We can talk about it. We're yeah, meeting on Wednesday. We can, meets I, we can talk about it Wednesday. Do. And I, I believe that from our meeting with the legislators, I think that they understood that and they looked at this situation. And I believe that we do have a, a potential trump card to play if Virginia Tech does not want to talk. And I think that we have the possibility of going to the legislature and maybe looking at some changes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I sure would like for everybody to sit at the table and be able to work things out rather than have a third party make the decision for us. Right. I think um, you're right. I think the town of Blacksburg does have a 
a special liaison group they that meets with they have a town with gown with tech, liaison yeah. like town and gown or something and mm -hmm. perhaps we can connect up with them uh, you know along with the town of Christians so but, uh, getting probably, each body to pass a resolution yeah. I think what? getting each body to pass a resolution I think might be helpful uh, I'm not asking for it tonight. I'd like to mm -hmm. discuss it more. Maybe there's some aspects to it that I'm not thinking about that might end up hurting us in the long run. Uh, but that, that's my thoughts. Right. And, and I think they've discussed it in that town and gown quite extensively. So, you know, maybe we could get some information from them as to how they've approached it. Um, well, I know we approached it a long time ago asking for tickets and football tickets and, you know, entertainment. <laughs> type things and tax, an events tax and we, and, and events tax and but we didn't do a resolution uh, I think uh, there are a number of things we could do that would be more and, and again I'm not talking about taxing the students who don't have a choice about where they eat I'm right. talking about when I was a kid I used to watch all the people that used to work at tech they went into town and, and had their lunches right. that doesn't okay. happen anymore and those folks they have businesses in Blacksburg are trying to compete with, uh, with the, the folks over on Tech's campus. And we're having Virginia Tech, and they're encouraging their students at graduation to tell them to eat on campus, not to go out to the community and eat. Uh, that was done through emails. I kept the dorm open this year. The what? dorms were open so that open. you didn't have to go stay in a hotel. You could stay in a dorm. Uh, those are, in fact, businesses, and they're directly competing with people do have to pay taxes and, sure. and I think that that's the way to approach it um, and and like I said maybe get each one of the bodies to pass a resolution <laughs> then go before tech sit down with them um, and, and like I said I think that's a way to, to move forward uh, I'd like for everybody to think about it maybe we can put it on the agenda in, in a few weeks or a month or something we'll find out a, uh, how warm that thought is uh, Wednesday morning when we meet with the, the some uh, town and, and, and gowns, uh, I mean, uh, town towns county. and county liaison <laughs> meeting, and we can let you know whether that thought is warm or cold from those two particular councils. If it's cold, we'll tell you, you know. <laughs> Okay. Well, um, another thing that sort of goes along, with, it's not like the meal tax, but um, I don't know how many years ago this was, but we were looking at um, did other universities do anything differently? And, and I think what I remember, and you know, it might need to be checked out, but I think that UVA did something with Albemarle County. Um, I don't think it was a meals tax, but they gave them some kind of money, and I don't know what kind of money it was. To compensate for And so it might be worthwhile to find out what some of the other state universities might or, uh, be doing um, for the communities in which they live. I mean, um, monetarily. Uh, and that was, that, I mean, because that, I mean, that had to be over 10 years ago that we looked at that, but right. there might be some other avenue to, to approach it with. I believe the town of Blacksburg did a study just a few years ago, and it was found that it protects one of maybe one or two state schools in the entire state that doesn't collecting the taxes, not paying the taxes, because that's the key thing. Right. 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 Paying the taxes, just simply collect the taxes, yeah. yeah. So um, I, I'd be interested to hear what, what the town of Blacks I'm sure the town of Blacks are very interested in this. I mean, I, I, from everything I know about the tax budgetary situation, I mean, and their past stances there, <laughs> They're not long term yeah, stances. Yeah, I can remember yeah. 20 years ago with the town of Blacksburg yeah. approaching them about meals, tax, et cetera, et cetera. So, of course, players change. Can I mention one more thing? Yeah, go just, ahead. Uh, just yeah. one brief thing before we close. I wanted to mention uh, at the last meeting, <clears throat> and I think we got the word out, but I wanted to make sure uh, for the joinder public hearing, we had indicated that we would schedule it for July 23rd. After the meeting, we realized that we didn't have 30 days notice from the time of the meeting to July 23rd. So that public hearing has been moved or scheduled for uh, the first August uh, board meeting, which is Monday, August 13th. But 
for those that were interested in that, I know we had said July 23rd. I think we even sent out information the next day saying it was the 23rd. But after we took a look, we realized we didn't we didn't have sufficient time to call it, so it got moved from the 23rd to August 13th. But I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware well, of that. We want to get together to discuss it whenever you would like. We can yeah. talk about it as a board. I thought that was something that we were planning on doing. Is that not? in the schedule i don't have it on an upcoming agenda my and certainly we'll do whatever the board desires the, the I know thought we had one meeting and we had several things that needed answers to and i haven't heard of any of the answers i think staff's thinking on that was that we would have the public hearing on the 13th and then address any concerns that came from the public hearing and any concerns that came from the board either at that meeting or a subsequent meeting and then take action because I don't think we're proposing to take any action on the 13th we're just having the public hearing that was I think that was kind of the thinking on that but we can if the board desires to do something differently we will we'll. I just hate to run out of time it's still not have time to talk know the things that we need to know and whether we can whether you've got anything done with, with them or or any you know whatever uh, it's my opinion that y'all would meet again and some of the questions that come up in a other session and things over there that might be some of the same questions that the general public uh, may come up with and probably some new questions that we ain't even thought of uh, during the public hearing and it probably would be uh, a better time from my thinking is let's hear those public comments that's a public hearing on the 13th it won't take any action on this body here uh, or listen and then we can come together and have a have a discussion among ourselves or it can either be a work session or it can be uh, uh, can we do it in closed session or, or it can be a work session we can have a work session after that that public hearing the following in the following two weeks to discuss it further and uh, and because we have a work session that don't mean that we necessarily have to take action that that particular night so we've we've got a little time to uh, work on I just know that there was some serious work things there that uh, we needed to have straight before we made any kind of vote on it. So wherever it has to be, I don't know. Yeah. I'm game for anything, so everywhere else. So would you follow the thoughts of public hearing and then maybe after that work session and maybe along those lines? Yes, if that gives us time for, for uh, credit and maybe Marty or whoever has to go back to whoever they need to go to see and, and get see if they, what they can get done. Well, and, and one of the questions that I've already made a note of for Wednesday's town county liaison meeting is, are the towns any closer to moving forward on their sides? I you know Christiansburg had a public hearing. Blacksburg has not had a public hearing yet. Uh, tech is tech and the water authority have both I think pretty much handled their side but we need to hear from the towns as to where they are with the issue too so okay, so that issue that we talked about a couple of them has been somebody said to something to them about that no I don't think so, so <laughs> none of those have been addressed no why did we have the meeting well, we're, well, I mean, I mean, I know what you're saying, but we're moving along with, uh, I think, Tech's Board of Visitors has already addressed it. We're moving along with our public hearing, hoping that the two towns would schedule theirs pretty pretty soon to to go uh, along with ours. Um, and so you, you never know. We could well, sit here. Let, let me just say yeah. this. As it sits, I cannot vote for it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are two or three things on there that need to be looked at because they're potentially could cost millions of dollars that we don't have. 
and the, the town manager in Christiansburg and I, have, have, we were the only thing we talked about last week was who had power where, and we did not get a chance last week to talk about the joinder, but that's on the list. Okay, all right, I just thought I should. Well, I guess it's down to me. Okay, the first thing I want to say is is to say thank you to, to, to VDOT who cleared the roads. Thank you. I've seen so many strange power trucks in there. Uh, we didn't have power, and I was coming out of Price's Park Road, and there grew a parade of about seven trucks out of lines or somewhere. i never seen them before. And then uh, that was earlier today, earlier today when I was coming over here to PSA meeting. I seen another parade of them, a different company from Duke, not Duke Power. I, I think they was going... But uh, home. yeah, and uh, but the the power people, the telephone people, and 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 all the people who were out uh, trying to restore power, especially when the heat index is over 100 degrees, you know, I don't know how those those people stood it. Uh, I got telephone service yesterday because everywhere along the line coming out from Prices Fork, you seen a, a telephone truck. It was trying to figure out what the problem was and and. Uh, Transformers, I mean, seeing big old oak trees, I mean, oak trees about this big, fall down through a utility pole, take pole, transformer, and all. And uh, seeing three trucks there trying to put it up, then they must have called in some help, three more trucks, and, and they were there for like three days trying to get that thing up. <laughs> uh, and uh, echo what Craig said about the fire and, and, and rescue uh, people. Uh, I found that one thing, though, that uh, uh, there was sort of water out in our area. Uh, some of the farmers would ride through the little country roads, making sure people were okay, checking on all the people. And uh, matter of fact, my wife and I were sitting out in the shade tree, and pulls up, y'all got water. I mean, y'all got water. No, we got water outside the firehouse on a, on a faucet if you need water. And I said, well, good. I said, your generator's working, yeah? And says that, that's good. A lot of elderly people out of the way, they can use it for a cooling station. Well, they said the air condition screwed up, so. And then I says, well, at least in the, you couldn't find ice nowhere around here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so and I said, well, at least you got an ice machine. No, we ain't got an ice machine, you know. And I thought all rescue squads and, and fire departments have one. But so that's another issue we can talk about, uh, making sure that the air condition fix and in some way, shape, or form, find a little money to get an ice machine. Uh, okay. Other than that, that's uh, that's it. And uh, that's huh? That's a good idea about the ice machine. Well, everyone, Blacksburg, every the yeah. fire rescue, I've been in ice. You know, they got yeah. ice uh, automatic there machine. There are businesses in Blacksburg giving away ice. Well, yeah. I guess they are. You yeah. couldn't find no, you couldn't find ice on that side yeah. of town on Sunday. I stood out in front of Kroger has a machine out there that mm -hmm. makes a bag about every 25 minutes. And it was a line standing with the bag. And it was a couple of people in front of me when I got in line. And we started talking, and, and a bag fell down. So I'm like, it's pretty cool. And I said, I ought to get one pretty quick. So 25 minutes later, another bag fell down. And it was about half frozen, half wet. And I was going to get two bags. And I felt kind of sorry for the lady behind me. So I got one bag, and I said, man, you know, I said, if, if I was a criminal, when those two people went out with their bags of ice, I'd have snatched them and run. You know, you heard a pocketbook snatching, it'd have been ice snatching. But well, we got ten dollars back. <laughs> yeah, but uh, now, I mean, uh, but that that's all I have, and and then to thank, you know, just to thank everybody for pulling together and doing what they need to do um, to look after elderly people. I did uh, hear about this couple who the man is just about blind and he needs oxygen, the power went off, and, and they didn't have air conditioning up like us, but they slept in their van all night long with the air conditioner on. He couldn't hardly breathe, you know, so one of the firemen took care of uh, the next day with getting them some oxygen and that stuff, you been know, carbon so. monoxide. Yeah. Let, let me say something real quick. Yeah. I, I should have thanked the, the YMCA. They had uh, opened early. Uh, and stayed late where people wanted to take a shower, to come in there and take a shower down in Shelver. So, that's nice. Uh, that's good. I need to send kudos out to them because that was a wonderful thing to do. And we had one store down there uh, that he was losing all of his stuff and he didn't have a backup generator, so he passed out the food to anybody that wanted it and needed it. So, I thought that was good. And that, 
something that we should be kind you of know proud of. Another thing, I, when I was out at the solid waste collection site talking to one of the guys there, and he says, you just wouldn't believe the thought out food and stuff that people had lost that had sort of went out to those those boxes. He says, hey, we got, you know, thousands of pounds of that stuff mm -hmm. where people lost it in their mm -hmm. uh, freezers and stuff. But uh, do I hear a motion adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? You can call roll if you want to, but I think everybody's in favor. Aye. 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 Aye.